Stand by everyone. We will begin in approximately 30 seconds. Good evening. This is the June 15th, um, 2020 Board of County Commissioners regular meeting. Uh, we'd like to welcome everybody to this meeting and I'll turn this over to our chairman um, who is with us virtually through Zoom as well as our other eight county commissioners. Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Uh, good evening to everyone and welcome to our Pitt County Board of Commissioners evening session. Uh, we're going to have Madam Clerk, if you would, at this time, Call the roll. Yes, sir. Chairman McLawhorn. Here. Vice Chair Colson. Here. Commissioner Albright. Here. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Here. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Here. <laughs> Donnelly? Here. Commissioner Ward? Here. White? Here. Commissioner Perkins Williams? Here. Good evening. Everyone is present. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. At this time, we shall go into a moment of silent prayer. Uh, we want to pray for the families that has been affected by the COVID-19. Uh, also, shall we pray for the healing of this city, county, state, and nation. We pray for the love, peace, and justice, and equality for all, regardless of race, color, or creed. Amen. At this time, uh, we should have the approval of the agenda. Mr. Chairman, we do, we'd like to request one item to be um, removed from the agenda and pushed to July 13th. That is an item for decision on the Greenville Utilities Commission appointments. We were notified today by GUC that the person being um, nominated for reappointment actually has served his full two terms they would like to bring back a new nomination for your next meeting on the 13th. Okay, could you state, state what number that is again, Ms. Mann? Yes, it's un under um, items for decision, which would be number 10, and then number 10 is number nine, reappointment to the Greenville Utilities Commission. Thank you very much. Okay. Very good. We have a hand up, um, Commissioner Perkins Williams. Commissioner Williams? I move that we accept the agenda as amended. Do we have a second? Commissioner Ward. Commissioner Ward. Commissioner Ward. Has been moving. I second the motion. Very good. It has been moving properly. Second. 
Madam Clerk. Lawhorn? Yes. Vice Chair Colson? Yes. Commissioner Albright? Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick? Yes. Huggins? Yes. Commissioner Yes. Award? Yes. Commissioner White? Yes. Commissioner Perkins Williams? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Very good. Now we should go into the presentation, Mr. Manager. Yes, Mr. Chairman, we have two different sets of um, recognitions or presentations tonight. Normally, we would have um, these individuals come forward in person and be recognized before the full board and um, have them in person. But due to the COVID-19 um, limitations, we are basically just going to verbally recognize them. Then they will be recognized um, individually by their organizations otherwise. So first, you have 4-H um, recognitions and Lee Guth, our Cooperative Extension Director has asked us to recognize four individuals. And if I can just read quickly the information on them. The first one, well, let me just read the statement why we're recognizing them. That 4-H youth demonstrate their knowledge and skills through individual presentations and participation in structured competitions as individuals or teams. So as youth first participate in Pitt County or district events, they first participate in Pitt County in, in um, county or district events. And if, if successful, may be chosen to represent Pitt County, the county in a state or a national event. And we have four people we want to recognize. First is Jim Kittrell. He was selected to participate in the National 4-H Shooting Sports Competition in Grand Island, Nebraska. His team was second in the nation overall for compound archery. As an individual, he placed 19th nationally. And then the second individual is Matthew Daniel, qualified for, H for National 4-H Shooting Sports Competition in, in Nebraska. His team placed second for the overall hunter skills in the nation. He placed, placed 11th nationally. Thirdly, we would like to recognize Kendall Powell, who won the district and state competitions to be selected for the Southern Regional 4-H Horse Championships in Georgia. She won first place for her individual presentation on basic horseshoeing and farrier work. And lastly, we'd like to recognize Marissa Sudebeck, who was chosen to represent North Carolina and compete with the National 4-H Livestock Skillathon, which is a written exam and skill demonstration, as well as Quiz Bowl that included general knowledge of a, of a type of Jeopardy style competition in Louisville, Kentucky. Team won fifth overall in the nation for Skillathon and ninth overall in the nation for Quiz Bowl. They placed fifth in the quality assurance, which is the proper medical care and handling of livestock, and then fifth in the evaluation of meat feed and wool quality. We have um, certificates for each of those that we will make sure they receive, and they're the standard certificates that we issue for um, a recognition of their achievement. On the second set of recognitions are your Boy Scouts um, who have achieved the rank of Eagle Scout. We have a, a couple of young men to recognize. And as we normally point out, you know, Pitt County normally has about the double the percentage of young men who are Boy Scouts who actually achieve the Eagle Scout recognition in the nation. So we would like to recognize Samuel Craddock Harrison from Troop 826. And let me read their, um, very quickly their projects. To give them recognize these projects at times can involve hundreds of hours of um, effort on behalf of the individual Eagle Scout as well as those other scouts that help them achieve their um, their project and I'm going to read these out of order we're going to start with Landon Gregory Miller his project he constructed and installed a a five interfaith blessing boxes the second one is Jared Harris Kaplan he constructed and installed four large and sturdy benches at the Greene County Park and Recreation Site. Next one is James Allen Garner. His project he installed tree, tree identification signs at the Winterville Parks and Recreation Walking Trail. The next one is for Samuel Craddock Harrison. Completed major improvements at the Pitt County Community Garden. 
And your last recognition is for Bishop James Miles. He built, built sturdy tennis benches and picnic tables at a county facility. So Mr. Chairman, that is the conclusion of your presentations. Very good. Let, let me thank you, Mr. Manager, and certainly let me thank all of the, and congratulate all of the recipients with the uh, OH Youth Recognition and also the uh, Eagle Scouts, my, my fellow Eagle Scouts. Great achievement and we wish you well. Now, I think we have a motion in, uh, at this time to uh, accept these recognitions. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, do we have a motion for that, please? You have a hand up from Commissioner Floyd Huggins and Commissioner Ward. Commissioner Floyd Huggins? I so move, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commissioner Ward. I second the motion. Moving properly, second, Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk. McLawhorn? Yes. Vice Chair Colson? Yes. Commissioner Albright? Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick? Yes. Huggins? Yes. Commissioner Nunnally? Yes. Commissioner Ward? Yes. Commissioner White? Yes. Commissioner Perkins Williams? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have the public address to the board. I'm going to ask Madam Attorney and also uh, Mr. Manager to uh, address these at this time. Yes, Mr. Chairman, at, the, at this time we have 19 people who are signed up to participate virtually, um, either by voice or via by voice and picture through Zoom. We also have about um, four or five written statements to read in which folks had submitted emails and were not able to participate through um, voice or uh, or, or Zoom. So if you would like, we can proceed. We can ask the county attorney if she would to read the statement on public addresses to the board and the time limit for speech that is allowed. Yes, Pitt County welcomes comments on all matters of public concern. Before you speak, please state your name and address. I will keep your time at three minutes for speaker. Since we have such a large number of speakers this evening, um, when you hear the timer beep, please finish your thought and then we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. And it's very crucial that we adhere to the time limitation. We have a lot of speakers. And so when you uh, hear the beat, please uh, conclude your statement and we will proceed. Mr. Manager. Okay, our first speaker is Donna Riddick. Yes, hi. Good evening. I am Donna Riddick. I'm of Greenville, North Carolina. Good evening to all of you this evening. Um, I moved to Pitt County about five years ago from a small town um, after getting a job offer here. My youngest daughter is enrolled in high school here uh, and my oldest daughter graduated on last year. When we arrived here, we were very excited. We we're very thrilled about this new chapter in our lives, um, moving to a much larger city. Um, people, from where I'm from, see Greenville as a chance to, to get access to better jobs, better schools, and medical care. I remember when family and friends were desperately sick or ill, um, or even got injured, they would immediately be taken here for the best possible care. Um, Greenville and Pitt County represents hope. They represents change for the better, and it represents freedom and opportunities for people from small towns such as myself. Um, it offers a real chance to reach um, your potential. But um, when I see this statue of this Confederate soldier that we currently have at our courthouse, I see an oxymoron, a conflicting message. 
How can this place represent hope and change and freedom for everyone of Pitt County and brandish such a reminder of anguish, despair, murder, and shame for almost 40% of the people it serves? How and who would let such a reminder of the darkest times in US history remain standing in front of the very place that justice is supposed to be served for all of its people. My message to you is every day it remains the statue, it's costing you more. It's costing us more, more in credibility, more in integrity, more in more responsibility to the people that you serve. Too much is given, much is required. And I just think that you can't afford to wait anymore to do the right thing. If this county of ours welcomes all people and serves all of its people, including black people, myself and my family, my girls, this statue does not have a place in Pitt County and should be taken down immediately. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Ms. Manchin. Yes, next, Keith Cooper. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Keith Cooper from Belvoir. Uh, for 400 years, Blacks in America have suffered from discrimination, subjugation, and oppression. Indeed, slavery has left permanent scars on this country. Though 200,000 Blacks turned the tide for the Union Army, allowing it to defeat the Confederacy and thus institutionalize slavery, the North turned its back on Blacks thanks to the Compromise of 1877. Further, Jim Crow left a legacy of segregation based on race, voter suppression, and intimidation and an active KKK who often used lynchings to control blacks. How many Pitt County citizens would remember the Klan rally on East 4th Street in Greenville on October the 16th, 1965? How many would remember the United Klans of America welcomes you to Aiden sign that was hung up off the old Highway 11 August of 1966. Today, the social inequalities affecting Blacks are fueling massive protests around the country and the world. Triggered by the police murder of George Floyd and disenchanted and exploited Blacks want policy initiatives to better their plight in America. Therefore, I support the formation of a Pitt County Human Relations Council to be representative of the interests of all citizens throughout the county, including the unincorporated areas. This council could address hot button issues uh, proactively and promote an environment of peace, tolerance, and reconciliation. Any variation of this proposal must not be a paper tiger. It needs to have teeth. Finally, I support the removal of the Confederate monument at the Pitt County Courthouse. Erected in, erected in 1914 during the Jim Crow era, it symbolizes slavery and white supremacy. During the dedication speech, the sitting governor of North Carolina, Locke Craig, referenced Anglo-Saxon within the context of promoting ideology of white supremacy. He did this during the, he was a dedication speaker here in Greenville uh, in 1914. And after that, he was invited to a, a big barbecue that day. Remember, Confederate monuments idolize those who committed treason against the United States to maintain slavery and uphold white supremacy. Though a North Carolina law restricts the removal of objects of memory or public property, 
private property and public spaces may be exempt, exempt in this context out of concern uh, for public safety. So even with the law in the books, um, the, the statute could be removed by my interpretation uh, of the law, uh, especially if it's uh, private property you know, in a public space. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Next, Mr. Manager. Next, Minerva Freeman. Ms. Freeman. Good afternoon um, to all the county commissioners. Mine's a short and to the point. Uh, I will not insult your intelligence because I know that you know the history of the Confederate, uh, what's first the states, the flag, and, the, and why the statutes were put where they were. So I would just encourage you to take the statute down and to move it wherever, but to move it uh, from the courthouse. And I would also like for you to consider we have a university here in Pitt County, East Carolina University, where young people are being taught. And I'm sure in some history class and some of the other classes, they're taught about the history of slavery and how the North tried to appease the South by many times letting them get away with uh, things like this, uh, these statutes and so forth. So I would encourage you to uh, move the statute. I would, I've been reading up on it. I uh, understand there's some consideration if it was to be moved uh, to put it maybe at Alice King Park. I would hope not. I know Alice King, she's a fine person. And while I know that the park is just named after her, why would we want young families seeing the statue there? Uh, put it somewhere. I was thinking about the place over by the uh, farmer's market. There, uh, It used to be called Yesteryears. I think it's some kind of museum now. Maybe that's where it needs to go. But I would encourage you to, to move it from downtown to the, from the courthouse because this is where we go to, uh, to seek justice. And I hate walking past that statue. I really do. And I'll keep mine short. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Next. Okay, next you have Bal Valerie Holloway. Ms. Holloway. Ms. Holloway, can you hear me? Okay, we will assume that she is not logged on. We've got um, Greg Rock. Mr. Rock. Afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. Um, I'm just going to go off on a tangent real quick. Um, I think it's kind of silly to try to remove a statute due to the uh, situation that happened in Minnesota, because in Greenville, North Carolina, we have nothing going on that is, you know, so volatile, vi vi you know. Uh, we didn't have a police officer in our community putting their knee on somebody's neck or trying to attempt to hurt anyone in that type of, you know, situation. But all I got to say is, um, under the, you know, the code of 100-2.1, it does state that in order to remove the statute, there has to be a real good reason why you got to remove the statute. Uh, from what I've read, you have to talk to the historic commissions to get their permission on that thing. And it does say if it impedes traffic, if it is a hazard to detect, you know, pedestrians and stuff, then it should be removed temporarily for 90 days or removed to the point where it can be in a, uh, you know, a, a particular area where it's accepted. But, but 
as I'm speaking right now, I'm at work right now, but that's really all I got to say. I, I think the whole thing is kind of silly. But anyways, commissioners, you have a great day. Thank you. Next, Mr. Manager. Okay, next, Gerald, and forgive me for the pronunciation last name, but Proko Paraski. Gerald. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Gerald Prokopovich. I live on Oxford Road in Greenville. I teach American history at East Carolina University and specialize in the Civil War era and in public history. Uh, commissioners, I have written to you uh, individually about the reasons why I believe the statue should be removed. So what I will do today very quickly is uh, very briefly five reasons that you have heard or will hear from statue supporters and why those reasons are flawed. First, you'll hear that removing a monument is tearing down history. Professional historians agree that a monument is not history, it's a symbol of history. In the case of the Pitt County Monument, it's not even a symbol of accurate history. During the Civil War, Pitt County was divided. Many hundreds of men from the county volunteered to fight against the Confederacy, serving in regiments of the United States Colored Troops, or the first and second North Carolina Union volunteers. The monument doesn't mention them. Instead, it gives everyone who sees it the false impression that Pitt County was united in favor of the Confederacy and against the United States. For the full story, read Shifting Loyalties, the Union Occupation of Eastern North Carolina by Judkin Browning. That's another thing to talk about. Second reason, okay, some monuments might be wrong, but next you'll tear down Washington and Jefferson. Where does it end? That's the famous slippery slope argument. When you hear it, you know your opponent is out of ideas. You wouldn't tell a surgeon, don't take out my appendix. You might take out my heart and lungs and liver and kill me. No, you stop when you take out the thing you need to take out. Taking out one monument is not taking out all monuments. Third, this monument isn't racist. It honors white and black Confederates. The answer to that short answer is there aren't black Confederates. Uh, read searching for black confederates the civil war's most persistent myth by kevin levin it gives the details there were 200,000 black americans who fought for their country and maybe a dozen or two who fought against it fourth moving the monument won't end racism it's just a symbol true but symbols matter our forefathers changed the name of this town from martinsboro to greenville to honor an American patriot, Nathaniel Green, instead of a British governor, Martin. Symbols matter to them and they should matter to us. And finally, what's done is done. You can't change the past. My answer to that is we're not trying to change the past. We're trying to change the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. And I apologize for not pronouncing your first name. <laughs> we appreciate you and appreciate what you said. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Manager Nakes. Jerry McRoy. Ms. McCoy. Mr. McCraw. You hear me? Yes. Okay. Should I go ahead and begin? Yes, you begin. Yes, ma'am. Commissioners, my name is Jerry McCoy. I live at 1017 Van Gert Drive in Winterville. I was born in 1954 in Greenville in the building which currently houses our county offices. My early life was that of a farmer's son. My dad was known as a sharecropper, and I can assure you my upbringing included a firm understanding of hard work and Christian values. I grew up primarily with black and white folks of modest means and learn the value of working together to make things happen on the farm, to ensure the crops were attended to and brought to harvest, to ensure everyone shared in the benefits of their labors. Although I came to age in the midst of desegregation and graduated from North Pitt High School in 1972, I did not hate anyone of color. Yes, we had to learn a bit more about each other as we were blended together. But I feel most of us adjusted well and became people who strive to raise honest, respectable families and to do our best in life. 
After a three-year foreign assignment in the U.S. Army, my work life started in earnest when I joined Burroughs Welcome in 1977. I worked there for many years. In 1999, I headed north for 18 years, three years in Massachusetts, and 15 in the New Jersey and New York area. I had been led to believe by some that racial prejudice was exclusive to my native region of North Carolina, of, of the South. However, my eyes were truly open when I ventured north. My biggest lesson of my years up north was that racism and ethnic strife was not relegated to the South, but it is abundant everywhere in our land. I never saw a single Confederate statue or monument in northern states, although I saw many northern statues and monuments to their Civil War soldiers and heroes, but yet the racism and ethnic strife was still very apparent. My time in the North revealed much in terms of racism, while my time in Massachusetts was pleasant in terms of race relations, my tenure in New Jersey and New York area was much different. My time there revealed a much more sinister type of racism from what I had seen in my native North Carolina. I recall several high-profile cases during my time in the North that occurred between police and unarmed black men. Two such incidents were the shooting of Amadou Diallo in 1999 in the Bronx of New York City, and the chokehold death of Eric Gardner in 2014 on Staten Island in New York. I thought both cases resulted in unnecessary fatal outcomes for the victims, and yet there was not a single Confederate statue or monument in sight. And even in the most recent death of George Ford in Minneapolis, same fatal, fatal outcome for an unarmed black man, and not a single Confederate statue or monument in sight. The Confederate monument at the Pitt County Courthouse, our Confederate dead, was erected on the grounds of Pitt County Courthouse in 1914, 106 years ago, to memorialize the great sacrifices of our local Confederate soldiers. Many died to protect their families, their farms, and their way of life. Without their bravery and sacrifice against Lincoln's Union Army scorched earth raids on Sherman's March to the Sea, North Carolina may have looked very different today. Am I still on, please? Mr. McRoy, we asked to, need to ask you to wrap it up. You've exceeded your time limit. If you can briefly... Oh, okay, let me throw in one quote that I have at the end. I created myself last week. Racism is never found in a monument or statue. It sprouts in the mind and flows from the heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mann. Okay, next, James Butler. Ms. Butler. James Butler. Yes, sir. James uh -huh. Butler. James Butler, Aiden, North Carolina. Thank you. You hear me? Yes, sir. You you can talk. Okay. I agree with the gentleman just up there talking. If you take if you take the northern people out of North Carolina and send them back north, the racism's gone. The people down here has always got along with each other. We've always lived together, worked together, and done good together. And I cannot see a statue causing this much problem in our cities. It don't make no sense. And furthermore, the lady, the lady that looked there a while ago earlier. She even said something about uh, the flag. Now, that flag she's talking about was a battle flag. That flag, flag meant no racist or no, no human being in, in the United States. That was a battle flag, the one with the cross in it. And any, anybody can look it up. It's, it's right there in black and white. They can read it for themselves. But I have a question. If y'all do move this statue, who's going to pay for it? Can you answer that? Mr. Butler, we don't answer questions at public addresses. Just You're just allowed to um, make your statement, and then um, that is the purpose of public addresses to the board. Okay. Well, my suggestion is leave, leave it where it's at. It hadn't hurt anybody for all these years except right there by itself. That statue represents the blacks, the whites, and all. I was raised on a farm. At 18, I left the farm. Got a public job. I was drafted into the army. I give Uncle Sam my time. I come back home. I still get along with the black people. 
I still get along with the white people. I have no problem with nobody. I just wish everybody could turn this stuff loose and let it go. Let things alone. Let them stay like they are because everybody should love that statue. It represents the blacks, the whites, all in one. And I have no problem with seeing it stay there. And I think it should stay there. And I'm going to fight to keep it there. I'll put it that way. I yield back my time. Thank you. Ms. Mann? Yes, next, Marcus Karachan. Mr. Garrison? Mr. Garrison? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, sir, you on. Yeah, it's Marcus Karachan, Aiden, North Carolina. How y'all doing tonight? I uh, just want to say good evening, everybody. And first of all, I am in support of this monument to not be moved. And my reason for this is this is a historical monument that was put in place 106 years ago in remembrance of our fallen soldiers of all color that fought to defend their homes and their land and everything against a tyrannical government. It doesn't have anything to do with slavery. It hasn't hurt anyone. and hasn't been even a topic until just the last couple of years. Recently, we've been under attack by un-Americans that are controlled by an evil agenda, same as the left liberals that want to take away our freedoms and our rights in this country. It's not just about this monument, but so many across the nation. True history is under attack, and by removing these monuments from across our nation, there's nothing to remind us of our past. They are, removing our, they are removing our past and rewriting history to change America to no longer be free. Without true history to learn from, you cannot have a good future. The only reason all this chaos is even going on and more monuments are even being attacked is because it's been allowed since the first one's been removed. This should have never even been allowed. When will all this madness stop? When will we stand our ground? and not give in to these terrorists. That being said, it is against federal and state laws to remove, this mon remove these monuments, and they need to be left alone. If moved, there are, <clears throat> there are many prepared to file lawsuits on the individuals that partake in its removal, and along with criminal charges. It's not the responsibility for the taxpayers to foot the bill for the removal, nor to pay lawsuit fines. The, <clears throat> the people of this county wasn't even given a chance to even vote on this decision, only the commissioners, and that's wrong. It does not belong to commissioners, anybody. it belongs to the people. It belongs to the people 106 years ago to put it up, and the ones that fought in the war a long time ago. In this county. If it gets moved... It, it's most likely it's going to be damaged, and that will be even more fine. So who's going to pay for that? It does not need to be stored anywhere. There is no other better, safer place for it to even be. It's on a courthouse grounds downtown by a sheriff's office and everything with lots of cameras where it can be watched. And there's police close by. Where else can it have a safer place to be? The best thing to do is just leave it where it is. Eventually, the short-term drama from the left that want to tear it down will pass. But if it's moved, it will, it will not only be costly, and it will be a costly and aggravating battle for a long time. The monument was not erected to be taken down in the, for, in the future. It was, it was built strong. It was built to stay. So it's going to be a very, very costly move and most likely get damaged. And like I said, there's there even more fines. Mr. Kirchner, I'd like to ask you to wrap yes. up. Yes. All I hope is y'all decide to do the right thing and make a wise decision. And remember, a country without history, true history, has nothing to learn from, and you will fail. God bless you all, and God bless the United States. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Yes, next, we have um, Michael Karachan. Okay. Mr. Michael? Uh, Mr. Ma Michael, are you on? Hello, this is Michael Carriage, and can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Terrington. Okay, looks like we had a problem. Uh, yes, I'm Michael Carriage, I'm 76 years old. I was born down here on the Jackson Farm. 
uh, Jackson Cemetery and uh, Jackson Town Road and all that. Anyhow, I go way back. I live here on Highway 11, just up from the Aiden Grifton High School. At any rate, uh, some man mentioned history, so let me mention a little bit of history, okay? First of all, not the first slave was ever brought into this country on a southern ship. They were all brought in on northern ships. The northern ships picked up the slaves down there from the British under the Union Jack off their islands. And how did the slaves get to the British? Well, the Negroes in Africa who warred with tribe after tribe, they sold, they sold the Negroes to the British. The British then came here, sold them to ours, and it then came on northern ships to the north. And the largest trading house for slaves was two blocks away from the White House, and it was in operation throughout the whole war. A lot of people don't know that. Not only this, the main bodyguards to uh, General Jackson and General Lee were black soldiers. Matter of fact, they used to have a saying for both of them, uh, you just, we'll watch your back. Now then, since so many whites had to go to the, the army, and this was a free army. It wasn't a conscripted army like it was up north. Up north it was conscripted. Down here it was not. It was all free. Free blacks and free whites joined the army. They had the same clothes, same food, same. They slept in the same tents. They had the same everything. And since so many whites were gone, guess who was running the farms? The blacks were running them. They were the ones that were in charge, mostly. And not only, not only this, a lot of people don't know this, but 97% of the blacks had already been freed in the South. And the largest slave owner in the South was in South Carolina. Paul Harvey did a show on it. And it was a black man, a rich black man. Matter of fact, the rich blacks came from the South. They didn't come from the North. Up in North, they were tied up in all kinds of slavery up there, up North. Matter of fact, Grant kept his slaves even after the war was over. General Lee, as soon as he inherited them, he set them free. Okay? So 97 were already set free. They had their own farms. They had their own businesses. They had their own churches, towns. Some, there were even those that had been elected into government positions, elected into government positions. So most of what you hear in this so-called history that I just heard is a lie. The man says, you go read a book. Well, go look and see who looks at, read the, broke the daggone books. All you got to do is look into congressional history, and you can find all this out. And that monument represents white soldiers, black soldiers, Jewish soldiers. A lot of people don't know one of the highest-ranking officers in the Confederate Army was a, was a Jew. Okay? There was no disparagement whatsoever in the Confederate Army. But when you go to the Northern Army, I forgot the name of the general, but he was threatening to shoot a whole brigade because they refused to fight alongside black soldiers until he said, I'll put you all in front of a firing squad and shoot you. You don't hear about that. You also don't hear how 300 newspapers were closed up by Lincoln because of the fact they were saying the South have legally voted out. Here's they have done everything legally to leave. Let them Bert, leave. Your time has expired. Unless you have a concluding comment, we need to move on. Well, what I'm just saying is that statue there represents all of the soldiers that fought black, white, Jew, everybody, and the lies need to stop, and it needs to stay there. And these paid terrorists that are coming in here, there's a site where you can sign up to get paid to come in and riot. It right, needs to be put to an end. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Manager? I'm Cheryl McCoy. Ms. McCoy? Ms. McCoy. Okay, evidently she is not connected. Okay. Next, Scott. Okay. Just unmuted her. Ms. McCoy, are you there? If 
if you are there, we cannot hear you. Mr. Chairman, would you like me to move on? Yes, sir, if you will. Okay. Next, we have Tammy Jeanette. Ms. Jeanette. Um, yes, hello. Yes, we can hear you. Hey, hey, um, my name is Tammy Jeanette. Um, I was born and raised in Pitt County, and I'm calling from Griffin, North Carolina. And I'm calling in reference tonight to the dead monument statue. That statue was put at the Greenville Courthouse around 1914. It's been there 106 years ago. In the last 106 years, it has not bothered a soul, not one soul. That statue, it represents our Confederate soldiers, both black and white. Um, they didn't die to protect slavery. They died protecting their rights. They were not slave owners. Most were poor farmers and Pitt County citizens. And if you take that statue down, you're just spitting on their graves. And you're spitting on Pitt County's rich Southern history. You're catering to people who are not educated on the matter. Where does it stop? It all started with the death of Mr. Floyd. Until the death of Mr. Floyd, you didn't hear a word about any statues. And I want to put on rec record that I am totally against the removal of this statue. Um, that statue has been at that courthouse for years, and that's where it needs to stay. And people need to become more educated on the matter. Um, I didn't write a speech on this. I just found out yesterday that y'all were thinking about taking it down. Um, I always heard there was laws to protect our statues. And now we're having to go through this. If you take that statue down, it's just going to divide Pitt County more than Pitt County is being divided now. Um, I would highly recommend just please leaving that statue alone. It's like I said, it's not bothering anybody. I'm going to make this short and sweet. Just leave the statue alone. If you take it down, all you're doing is catering. And we need to stop catering to everybody. I mean, None of this happened until the death of George Floyd. I am really sorry what happened to the man. But the dead monument statue has nothing to do with Mr. Floyd. It's only giving people, it's giving them the right to think they can start causing chaos. And this world is crumbling down and people are caving in to everybody's wants and needs. But that statue, it represents dead soldiers who fought to save their land and their families in Pitt County. So please consider not taking it down. I really do believe that if it's taken down, um, it's gonna cause chaos in Pitt County. Um, that's really all I have to say. I didn't write a speech. I wasn't prepared to write a speech. So I'm just kind of cutting it short. I think I have um, made it clear how I feel. Okay. Mr. Manager. Next, Yoshi Newman. Hello, commissioners and all of those attending. As we've seen around the world, it's an unprecedented time in our lives. It is a time when history and conventional thoughts and actions are under a spotlight. It is a time for long, long overdue change. It is a time when change is a moral imperative. It has been painful for me to listen to some of the things that have been said here tonight. And I'm glad I had a mute function, quite honestly. Uh, I am calling with regard to the removal of the Confederate monument. I grew up in Iowa, just a few hours from Abraham Lincoln's home place. As a kid, I was taught the Civil War was the war against slavery. We were taught and shown pictures and drawings of atrocities of white-skinned people committing crimes against brown and black-skinned people. I was horrified as any kid, as any decent person would be. This happened in my country. This happened in America. I was disillusioned and ashamed. It was unthinkable that a Confederate monument, statue, or symbol anything honoring or memorializing the Confederacy 
which symbolized slavery and the oppression and human rights violations of other peoples would be displayed in public places, local, county, and state buildings, or anywhere in public. Anything honoring the fallen dead of the Confederacy represents honoring what they died for, states' rights to own slaves. This is a straightforward issue. The monument at the courthouse must come down. Where will it be put? The issue has been raised. The burden has, should not be on taxpayers, but it should be relocated to a local cemetery and placed lying down where anyone who chooses to come and visit can. There are so many things that we could go on to talk about, but it comes down to this for me, is if you look at the founding documents of our country, the preamble of the Constitution, the Constitution, the Pledge of Allegiance, you either support the Confederacy or you support America. You can't have it both ways. Thank you, I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Um, next, Mr. Manager. Next, you have Frankie Purser. Okay, my name is Frankie Purser. I'm from Vanceboro, North Carolina. I'm a descendant of five Confederate soldiers. Um, first, I'd like to say the reason why that the, the statue is erected at a Pitt County courthouse is because my ancestor, Abner Nelson, that he signed up for the Confederate Army at the Pitt County courthouse. And as far as these soldiers being linked to treason, under Article 6 of the Constitution of the United States, they cannot be linked to treason because the 13 colonies were recognized by the Paris Peace Accords of 1783 as independent countries. So they had the right to get out of the Union any time they wanted to. I personally don't agree with slavery. It is a black eye on our history. I mean, any time anybody is worked and not compensated for their time, that is bad, but it's no more than what's going on now through the Federal Reserve System and taxation. But to the college professor, I would like to address him about some certain things. He said there was no black Confederates. My ancestors served in the North Carolina 1st Infantry. It was an integrated unit. It was integrated 80 years before the United States Army was. And if he does not believe me, there is a book about four inches thick at the North County Historical Society has that book, and it's from Pender County, and it's all blacks who fought for the Confederacy. I don't know if he's familiar with Lewis Gates, who teaches African-American studies at Harvard University. He's good friends with President Barack Obama. He believes... He has contacted the North Carolina State Archives. He's found that there was black Confederate soldiers. They received pensions years later from the state of North Carolina. So that statue does represent whites and blacks. This is true. I mean, these people, that's, that's how come the situation this country has got to where it's at now. People who are teaching in universities, misinforming the youth. That is one of the major problems right now. This Black Lives Matter, they're nothing but a terrorist organization just like the Ku Klux Klan. If it wasn't for the Klan, we wouldn't be really having this issue because they've hijacked the flag of the Army of Northern Virginia. The 54th Massachusetts, who was depicted in the movie Glory, Black Lives Matter vandalized their monument to them this past week. The first black who ever received the Congressional Medal of Honor was in that regiment. Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization, and these white millennials that go along with it don't even know, they don't know history. The reason why people don't know history is because they do not study history. I mean, that's basically all I have to say. Some of the things that some of these people said, you can tell they don't know nothing about history. I mean, as Purser, far as the ladies talking about Ms. Purser, your time is up. Can you conclude your comments, please? Yes. I, I would like to challenge uh, the, the college professor from ECU in a public forum on this uh, matter.
Okay. I mean, I'm just a country boy from Vanceboro, North Carolina, but I have studied history my entire life. Thank you, Mr. Purser. We need to we need to move on. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Manning. And next we have Frankie Bardot. Ms. Bardot. Ms. Bardot, can you hear me? Hi, good evening. Good evening. Hi, um, I, I am a black woman whose roots run deep in Pitt County, Pactolas, 1700s. As a young child growing up, I just thought that the Confederate statue on the Pitt County Courthouse grounds was there because it was supposed to be there. Now as time has passed, I am an informed adult. I know that the statue is there because white folk had enough of reconstruction and wanted to remind black folk that white supremacy was still the rule of the land. Praise God that the time has long come that this symbol of white supremacy is no longer acceptable, no longer the rule of time. My condolences, sympathy, and love go out to the grieving families and friends of Mr. George Floyd, Ms. Breonna Taylor, Mr. Ahmaud Aubrey, Mr. Michael Brown, Ms. Sandra Bland, and the many other black folk who have lost their lives to unwarranted and senseless violence from the police. We need to capitalize on the momentum for change and the mood of the country that these victims' deaths have caused and follow suit as to what other towns and counties have done and plan to do. I also am asking you to vote for the removal of the Confederate statue from the Pitt County Courthouse grounds immediately. It has been there far too long. This statue represents exactly what history states that it represents. It represents slavery, rape, horror, bigotry, racism, and hatred. As a black person, I am offended when others state that it represents something good, heritage. And it certainly does not represent Blacks. The heritage that it beholds is white supremacy, white oppression, treason, death, and destruction. I want to go on record and state that I will do whatever I can to keep the removal of this Confederate statue from the Pitt County Courthouse grounds on the minds of people. It is my opinion that our taxes should not be used to pay for the housing and maintenance of a monument that, symbolize, that symbolizes inhumanity and inequality. Black lives matter, black lives do matter. It is not a terrorist organization. It is an organization of a very diverse group of people who want equality and social justice for black folk. That's all we're asking. We're asking for what's entitled to us based on the constitution. And this statue represents death, destruction, separation of families, rape, misery, horror, and humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pardo. Mr. Manager. Mr. Chairman, um, Cheryl McCoy has come back on, raised her hand in Zoom. If you'd like to choose one that we could not hear a few minutes ago, if you'd like to go back to her. Yes, Ms. McCoy. Ms. McCoy? Maybe. Again, she's used the raise hand feature to say she would like to speak, but apparently she is having technical difficulties. That being the case, we will move on the list if you're ready, Mr. Chairman. Yes, yes sir. Okay, we next have um, Roderick Jenkins. This is Jenkins. Hello, I'm Roderick Jenkins from Greenville, North Carolina. Shout out to Keith Cooper. I was raised in Belvoir. So I want to say something really short. There are currently two petitions on the website change.org to remove the Confederate statue from the Pitt County Courthouse. The first was started three years ago by Chris Rickson and has over 7,300 signatures. 
The second was started two weeks ago by Jessica McNally, the owner of Purple Blossom Yoga Studio. And I'm actually uh, speaking on her behalf. She had a uh, family emergency. We've been working on this together for the past couple of weeks. Um, and also she wanted me to point out that uh, what we're talking about is not destroying or discarding the statue. Um, in reference to Miss Minerva Freeman's point, uh, we think that the village, the village of yesteryear, which is a historic museum on County Home Road, would be a perfect location. <clears throat> From a personal standpoint, as a black man, it is an understatement to say that seeing a Confederate statue in front of a courthouse does not fill me with a sense of confidence that I'm going to receive justice or be treated equally when I enter that building. This is why I feel like this is the worst location to have the statue. In fact, by being in front of the courthouse, the Confederacy appears to be receiving the endorsement of the local court system. I do not believe that this statue represents the attitude, belief, and mindset of the majority of Greenville citizens. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Mann? Next, Susan Pierce. Uh, and who was the next one, Ms. Manger? Susan Pierce. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you all. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, one moment, let me share my video. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention to this issue. Uh, I live on Southeastern Street in Greenville. And uh, I would like to say uh, in support of the removal of the Confederate monument that this week, the nations and the world's eyes are watching the cities of Birmingham, Alexandria, Richmond, our neighbor Rocky Mount and many, many other cities remove or vote to remove their Confederate monuments. And this week, Greenville and Pitt County have the opportunity to join these leaders and make international news by following suit or our city and county could choose to do the opposite to make the news for being among the last to remove its statue. And I believe that eventually the statue will be removed. So will Pitt County be a leader or a follower on this his history making symbolic front? Uh, now, not only is now the time, it's long overdue. As many have already mentioned, it was the monument was raised in 1914 and it was one of many erected in the Jim Crow era to celebrate and uphold white supremacy, interpreting the Civil War as a lost cause. On the day it was unveiled, the entire student body of the East Carolina Teachers Training School, now ECU, and its faculty marched to the site carrying Confederate flags as the band played the song Dixie. This monument does not reflect the values of today's ECU with its racially diverse student body. Further, as several people have mentioned, there's an ironic symbolism of the presence of the monument representing the Confederacy, which historically defended the system of race-based slavery on the grounds of the courthouse, which represents equal justice under the law. Too many residents of Pitt County are victims of racial injustices, as were their families who lived when this monument was erected. I'm quoting uh, ECU alumnus Jermaine McNair, executive director of NC Civil, and he says, signs or symbols can mean a lot to many people, as we've heard today. To one person, it can be pride, for another, it can be pain. But when you wave something with pride that you know causes pain to other people, whether that pain be brought on to me or anyone, we have to make a decision. Pride or compassion, and human compassion should always outweigh personal pride. And I quote the uh, mayor of the city of New Orleans as it toppled its Confederate monument three years ago, uh, Mitch Landrieu, he says to literally put the Confederacy on a pedestal in our most prominent places of honor is an inaccurate recitation of our full past. It is an affront to our present, and it is a bad prescription for our future. In the current moment of national confrontation with structural racism, the meaning that this monument carries for African Americans in Pitt County needs to be given the utmost consideration. It is time for Pitt County Monument to the Confederate dead be removed. Now is the optimal time as the new Sycamore Hill Gateway Plaza nears completion just blocks away a neighborhood that was unjustly erased. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Manager. Ms. 
Mr. Chairman, the last and the 17th, at least of our verbal comments will be from William Cratch, and then we'll have the comments to be read. Okay, Mr. Cratch. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity to address the Commissioner Board as uh, well as yourself, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, my name is William H. Cratch. Uh, I'm 29 years old. I'm a resident of Beaufort County, but I have extensive family and uh, a lot of acquaintances in Pitt County. My family history goes between both counties. Uh, my grandfather was Colonel James Gorham of Pitt County, who you can state for the original record, uh, he was the leader of the Commission of Safety during the American Revolution. He signed the North Carolina State, Const State Constitution. Uh, he was a very big patriot uh, well, within the community. To hear some of the statements that have been made against the Confederate monument are, are just absolutely sickening and very Naziistic. Uh, several statements that have been made have led me to question, what is the true intention of this board as well as the true intention of the people that are calling in against this monument? I guarantee you that if you did close observation, uh, which I'm sure that most of you have, these people have similar leanings, whether it be politics, what have you. Symbolism. I've heard people mention symbolism. Symbols are very, very important here. To erase this symbol, you are taking it out of context. You are making it look you know, as if this did not happen. Man, I'm a proud uh, descendant of many Confederate soldiers. My family is deeply rooted in the Confederacy. And I can assure you, they did not own slaves. They fought to protect their country, the Confederate States of America, from the invasion, you know, of the same outside army or the same empire, or as many dignitaries said back then, the unseen hand that is pulling the strings. And it may very well be the same hand that's pulling your strings. So I ask you uh, that if you're looking for racism, you're going to find it because it's in your heart and in your mind. Taking down this monument is a disgrace. You know, it is unconstitutional and a desecration to those that stood for truth and freedom. If you take down this, this particular monument, the chaos that ensues will be on your hands. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I leave you with that statement. Okay, Mr. Manager. Chairman, we now have um, four written statements. If you'd like me to proceed to read those. Yes. Okay, your first one is from Caroline Shack from Winterville, North Carolina, regarding the monument. The subject is comments about removing Confederate statue from courthouse. It says, thank you for inviting public comments regarding the issue of removing the Confederate statue from the Pitt County Courthouse. I'm a 40 year resident of Pitt County and a retired ECU instructor who wishes to go on record as being strongly in favor of removing the statue. The Confederate statues of the South symbolize the brutalization and enslavement of human beings, the dehumanization of African Americans and the taking of children from their mothers and selling them as slaves. The disenfranchisement, marginalization and violence against people of color have continued throughout our history. There are many layers of institutional structures and cultural symbols beliefs and norms that continue to maintain injustice, inequality for some, and privilege for others. Removing the Confederate statue is one small but important symbolic step that signifies readiness and willingness to address the injustices and inequalities that have plagued this country since its inception. Thank you for taking these comments into consideration as you deliberate this important matter. Sincerely, Caroline Shack. Next, we have a written statement. Um, subject, Pitt County and NAACP comments on Confederate monument by Calvin Henderson, who is the president of the Pitt County and NAACP chapter. Dear commissioners, for over 111 years, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, referred to as the NAACP, was formed on the behalf of embodied, on the belief embodied into the Constitution of the United States of America. We support democracy, democracy, dignity, and freedom. 
The NAACP's vision is to ensure a society in which all individuals have equal rights and there's no racial hatred or racial discrimination. Our mission is also to ensure the political, educational, and social and economic equality of, of, of rights of all persons and to eliminate racial hatred and racial discrimination. The NAACP fully supports efforts to remove the Confederate monuments from public spaces around the country. In order for our country to move forward, to become a nation united and free from inequity and bigotry, we must remove Confederate symbols from our parks, schools, streets, court, county courthouses, and other areas that define America's landscapes and culture. We believe that people have the right to have monuments, but it should be not, but it should not be financed by public dollars on public display. The NAACP feels it is okay to relocate such monuments in a museum or cemetery. For the protection and safety of all citizens of Pitt County, the Pitt County NAACP feels that now is the appropriate time to make the important decision on relocation of a status that represents a hateful slash racist history of white supremacy and black suppression in our country. And he quotes um, Dr. Martin Luther King from 1964 at the end, where it says, quote, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. The true man will, ri will risk his position, his prestige, and even his, his life for the welfare of others. In dangerous valleys and hazardous pathways, he will, lift, he will lift some bruised and beaten brother to a higher and more noble life. Calvin Henderson, President of the County NAACP. Next, we have a written comment from Stacy Streeter Moy. Subject, request re to remove Confederate statue. Dear commissioners, I'm writing to you from the perspective of a black woman who's lived in Pitt County for over 40 years, all of my life and who has resided in Pitt County for many generations. I'm aware of the previous, previous requests made in the past to remove the Confederate statue. These requests have gone unfulfilled for too long. In 1910, Pitt County stood on the wrong side of history as it allowed the statue to be indelibly erected to tower over its black citizens as a reminder of the very country, county in which they lived, made a blatant choice to honor those who fought to oppress them. Not only does the statue honor those who fought to keep my family enslaved, but it refers to those same Confederate soldiers as heroes. These were not my family's heroes in 1910 and they are not our heroes now. I believe the statue also reads that it was quote, erected by the people of Pitt County in grateful remembrance dot 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 of her Confederate soldiers, end quote. I can safely assure, sure that Pitt County commissioned that there was not one ounce of, of, there was not one ounce of grateful remembrance in the souls of those slaves who were forced to work and build structures to defend the very army who sought to keep them enslaved. I'm aware that there will be some who will argue otherwise and will submit that there were many valid reasons for which the Confederate soldiers fought. However, there is very little evidence to debate the fact that these same soldiers had an undeniable presumed understanding that they were fighting to advance their pro-slavery their, their pro agenda in the examination of the letters of Confederate soldiers offer little to no rebuttal of this idea. The Confederate statute is situated in close proximity to several properties that my husband and I own on Evans and Washington streets. And it is in the direct view of our property located at South Hunt at 300 Evans Street. As long standing investors in Pitt County in the uptown slash downtown district, who see the statue as a symbol of impression, of oppression, pro-slavery and white supremacist ideally, uh, ideologies, we are requesting that the Confederate statute be removed from our courthouse and city center immediately. It is imperative that the Pitt County Commission seize the opportunity to stand on the right side of history by removing the, by voting to remove the Confederate statute in a show of solidarity and support for those who have had to endure the painful reminder of betrayal and inequality for way too long. Thank you for your service to our community and for your prompt attention to this pivotal role of the removal of this statute, removal of this statute have on in the advancement and healing of our community. Sincerely, Stacy Streeter Moy and Maris and Morris J. Moy. Next we have a statement by Rebecca Powers. Subject entitled Removal of Confederate Monument at Pitt County Courthouse Citizen Comment. Um, I submit to you for the public comment period on Monday, June 15th, County Commissioners, County Commissioners, I address you today as a concerned citizen, an educator, and as an activist for social justice. The Confederate monument that stands at our county courthouse must be removed. It was put there to honor white supremacy 
and its horrific oppression of non-white people. Pitt County citizens have requested its removal before and now once again have called for its removal. It must not be standing at our county courthouse because it symbolizes injustice. Please take action now to remove the monument. Do what is right and remove the monument. Thank you, Rebecca Powers. We then have a comment from Gwendolyn Green. It's our last written comment. She states, as a resident of Pitt County who has visited the courthouse in an area of Uptown many, many times, I have always been struck by the disconnect of the symbol of equal justice under the law and the symbol of oppression, injustice, and hatred. That an entire community could continue to allow a Confederate statue, comma, symbolic of African Americans being de enslaved, denied of, of any human rights, and oppressed to stand guard at the, at the courthouse is indeed a travesty. Was the original intent to establish that African Americans could only receive justice as defined by pre-Civil War standards, question mark? I, hold, I wholeheartedly support moving the statue to the yesteryear museum so that none will forget the history here in Pitt County. Let us begin the healing, respectfully, Gwendolyn Green. And that ends your um, written comments, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as we would proceed on now, uh, we have the uh, items for the report, the Public Health Director, Dr. Silvanon. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, mm -hmm. commissioners. Uh, we are now six incubation cycles or 12 weeks and four days since the first case of COVID-19 was identified in Pitt County. We continue to accumulate cases, but as of Friday, I estimate that 67.8% of cases in Pitt County have recovered. As of 6-12, uh, which was last Friday, Pitt County had lost two residents. You're probably aware we added two to that today, but as of Friday, our death rate was 0.44. Uh, percent uh, of cases in Pitt County. Um, I'll share those most decent, recent uh, data graphs with you in a minute. I'd like to update you on the Pitt County Health Department exposure. Uh, all Pitt County Health Department potentially exposed staff um, were tested for COVID-19 and have tested negative. Um, they have all been returned to work. Uh, all Pitt County Health Department services are operational. Uh, the exposure source was retested using the state lab public health and that individual tested negative on repeat testing. This draws into question the validity of the individual's original test. I believe the original test was erroneously uh, reported as there were some uh, date, excuse me, date discrepancies on that report. Um, Pitt County Health Department has uh, internally reassigned several staff members to assist with contact tracing. Uh, we had our Region 10 Health Directors meeting this morning and um, uh, we still have, uh, are still awaiting uh, resources from the state. Uh, there have been none deployed in, in Region 10. None of the other health directors have, uh, have received any uh, resources from, uh, from the state. At this time, there are three active outbreaks in long-term care facilities in Pitt County. Uh, two are stable with all residents and staff having been tested. A third was identified last Friday, and we're still working that situation. Um, we know that there are two individuals positive in that uh, facility. Uh, we are working with them to obtain a testing for the rest of their staff and patients. To consider an outbreak over, the institution uh, must have no new cases for 28 days or two incubation cycles. So we have one closed outbreak here in the county that was at the Aiden facility and that, that, uh, that outbreak was declared closed uh, or over. Um, I'd like to move on and show you my graphs for tonight. Okay. So the first graph again is our um, Pitt County cases uh, by data specimen collection. Uh, the two tall points uh, represent the, uh, the outbreak at East Carolina Rehab and Wellness Center uh, going back um, uh, to the, uh, the first couple of days of June last week, uh, the first weekend of June. Uh, since then we've been, uh, we've been above where we had been still, still averaging probably between five and seven cases a day um, uh, on, a, on a rolling average. So you can see there, there is some increase there, increased activity uh, but the big spike represents the, uh, the nursing home outbreak uh, that we identified uh, about two weeks ago now. This is our cumulative number of COVID cases uh, by data specimen collection. So again, um, uh, as we collect cases, this, this curve or these numbers will always go up. Uh, what we'd like to see that curve do is kind of shoulder out and flatten out. Uh, we thought we were doing that um, until we had our, our nursing home outbreak. Um, you can see there's a little bit of a shoulder there. Uh, and then we've picked up 
Uh, this also reflects time uh, since Memorial Day uh, with increased mixing of people and also some, uh, some advancement in, uh, in lessening of restrictions by the, by the governor's order. Um, we also um, have seen the testing definition broadened uh, so more people are being test and tested and that, that is probably partially responsible for some of these results as well. Um, the next gra graph shows the um, uh, estimated recoveries um, uh, by date. Uh, you see on, uh, on June 12th, we estimated that we had 305 uh, cases recovered. Uh, that was out of um, 450 cases on Friday uh, were recovered. Here's our, our final summary slide. Uh, it shows that um, uh, we know of uh, 3,363 people who have been tested in Pitt County. Uh, we estimate that we are at least 3,000 negatives behind as of today uh, because of changes in how the state reporting system works. Uh, 2,886 individuals have tested negative. Uh, we have 480 active cases at this time. 305 estimated recovered at this time. And unfortunately, over the weekend, we added two deaths to our total, bringing our total death count in Pitt County uh, to four deaths, um, which is still probably far better than we had predicted based on any of the modeling. Um, and that's my report for this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions or comments? Scott, any hands up? Chairman, not that I can indicate at this time, unless there's some at the bottom of the screen, I can't see, but apparently not. I see no hands up. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank you, Dr. Sivanel, for that fine report and continue your great work. We, we go down to Sam Kroon, the our tax collection. Chairman Smallhorn, uh, commissioners, Mr. Manager, it's good to be with y'all tonight. Um, tonight I bring um, an item for report, the 2020 tax collection report. Um, but before I start that, I want to um, make the board aware that the Pitt County Tax Administration, Pitt County, um, along with the town of Farmville, has entered into an inter-local um, tax collection agreement. Uh, we will be um, collecting the 2020 taxes for Farmville and going forward. Um, public information is putting up a, um, a announcement that we're gonna be sharing with the residents of, of the town of um, Farmville to let them know that they will be getting one tax bill this year. Um, also, I want to bring um, to your attention that the city of Greenville has renewed their in local um, tax collection agreement with us as well. And then on to the report um, for the fiscal year, July 1, 2019 through May 31st, 2020, the combined collection rate for real and personal property is 98.89%. Um, this for the same period one year ago was 99.12. Um, our collection rate is closing in on last year's collection rate. Um, I'd like to give credit to the citizens of Pitt County um, they have um, worked with us this year to, to pay their taxes. And also I'd like to commend our um, tax collection staff. Uh, we still pursue all outstanding taxes due to Pitt County. Um, another thing that has came up um, that I'm aware of is um, how we're gonna collect the 2020 taxes going forward. If you look on the second page of your collection agreement, you're gonna see the three biggest items of collection are payment plans, call citizens, and manager and paralegal notes, which this is our written correspondence to citizens. Um, them are our three greatest collection um, tools that we use. We're gonna continue using these tools in 2020 um, if there's any concerns on um, the collection of taxes going forward. Um, my recommendation as far as the report is to approve the May 2020 tax collection report as presented. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kroon. Mr. Spann, you have any hands? Commissioner Ward's hand up. Commissioner Ward. I'd like to move for acceptance of the uh, tax collection report. Okay, very good. Do have a second? Second, uh, Mr. Chairman. Very good, thank you. Mr. White has your hand okay. up. 
has been moved and popped a second. Um, Madam Clerk. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you have Commissioner um, White's hand. I don't know if she had a question or if she was trying to second the motion or. Okay, uh, Commissioner White, will you? I, I was just going to second the motion. Very good, thank you. Madam Clerk. Chairman Allhorn. Yes. Vice Chair Colson. Yes. Commissioner Albright. Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Yes. Commissioner Nunnally. Yes. Commissioner Ward. Yes. Commissioner White. Yes. Commissioner Perkins Williams. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, very good. Uh, monthly financial report. Uh, Mr. Barnett, Brian. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and uh, Board of Commissioners. Um, you have in front of you tonight the monthly financial report for the general fund and the solid waste fund. Uh, at the end of May 31st, this is our 11th month or 91.67% uh, of the fiscal year. Um, on the general fund side, we have collected 86.3% of our anticipated revenues and we have spent 87.7% of our expenses. Uh, both of those numbers are slightly lower than, than they were at this point last fiscal year. Um, as I've mentioned all year long on the general fund side, uh, expenses are slightly higher than last year due to the purchase of the Warren Farm uh, back in July. Um, as of May 31st, uh, it's safe to say that we are starting to see the effects of COVID-19 on the county's uh, revenues, but we do expect this fiscal year to come in on the good side. On the solid waste fund, uh, as of May 31st, we have collected 89.84% of our anticipated revenues, and we have spent 81.31% of our expenses. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Do we have any hands, Mr. Manager? Um, um, Commissioner Ward and Commissioner White have their hands up. Commissioner Ward, then Commissioner White. Um, I make a motion that we accept the May 2020 monthly financial report. Okay, Commissioner White. I second that. Okay, it's been moved and properly second. Madam Clerk. Chairman McLawhorn. Yes. Vice Chair Colson. Yes. Commissioner Albright. Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Yes. Commissioner Nunnally. Yes. Commissioner Ward. Yes. Commissioner White. Yes. Commissioner Perkins Williams. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, very good. Mr. Manager, your report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A few things to report on. Your next meeting dates, um, in the month of July, you will only have one meeting on July the 13th due to the um, July 4th holiday weekend. That will continue in a Zoom environment like we are tonight, and that'll be a 9 a.m. meeting. And then your next meeting will be the first Monday of August on August 3rd at 9 a.m. At this point for the month of August, the jury's out on that in terms of whether that's in person or Zoom, we'll just have to continue to monitor what the um, governor's um, regulations limitations are, and we will um, um, proceed forward as, as deemed necessary. Tomorrow night, which is um, Tuesday, June the 16th, you do have your scheduled public hearing on the proposed fiscal year 2020-21 operating budget, and that'll begin at 7 p.m. That again will be a virtual meeting um, via the internet, just like we're holding tonight. The folks who would like to speak on that budget can um, email the clerk to the board or can call in and be registered to make public comments via voice or via um, picture with Zoom like we've done tonight on the um, public addresses. You do have a, um, then on Thursday, June the 18th, we have to wait at least 24 hours after the public hearing due to the virtual nature of, of holding the public hearing. We have scheduled a, a tentative vote on that budget for 9 a.m. Thursday, June the 18th. 
On item D, this is a um, good news item in terms of the detention center and a bed lease um, discussion that Sheriff Dance has had, and she's in the audience tonight, and she's asked me to go ahead and share this, that she's been the lead on this. I've, I've assisted her. We've been in discussion with Beaufort County about E-Block. Beaufort County is in the need of a short-term lease of the detention center and has we're, um, have pretty much negotiated out a 60-day a lease for that space with an option to go an additional 30 days that will um, provide additional revenue. This is entirely a revenue generating contract for the sheriff's office for, um, for additional revenue for the county. And um, my understanding is from the Beaufort County manager, their board approved this um, by a vote of their board tonight. And they're needing to lease the space as they are um, doing work on the, the courthouse there in Beaufort County, um, changing locks out and doing other, other renovations are having to um, vacate that space. So we are pleased to, to announce that. And again, this is total revenue generating for us. They're basically bringing their personnel over that will um, be, be manning e-block where these inmates will be and we will be collecting revenue off of that. Um, item E is a good news item. This deals with the interlocal agreement between you as the Board of County Commissioners for Pitt County and the City of Greenville regarding the interlocal agreement um, in which the current interlocal agreement passed back in, I believe, 1999 calls for the city to make two nominations to the Pitt County Industrial Development um, Commission Board. And about a month ago, you had passed a motion and asked that the city council consider um, an amendment to that agreement that would reduce their two appointments down to one. Um, the city of Greenville has informed us the Greenville City Council heard this and have um, consented to that and have our agreement to um, reducing that down to one. So currently you have one member of the Pitt County Industrial Development Commission, Mike McCarty, who, whose term will end on December 31st of this year, then the city will have the opportunity to make a nomination for somebody else. Uh, Mr. McCarty's term, two three-year terms will have ended. Um, the next item is not on the agenda, I have two other items. One, um, DSS um, had recognized our foster care gra graduates and we, we had a ceremony last week, Ms. Elliott, right? last Tuesday, and we've got a short one minute video we'd like to um, show. I believe our PO office may have this keyed up, I hope. If we can tune into that real quick and show that. And if not, I can go on to another matter and we can come back to that if we need. Not ready yet. Okay, I'll, I'm gonna go on to my, my last um, item I want to report on. This past week, this past Monday on June the 8th, I felt compelled to communicate with our workforce regarding the recent events of the, the past prior two weeks in our community, in our state, in our nation, and felt compelled to make a written statement to them as the county manager and as what some uh, employees would view as, as the leader of our organization from a, a manager standpoint. So I sent out this email on Monday about noontime. It's entitled um, County Manager Communication and it says Pitt County Workforce. Let me take a drink here real quick. This communication comes as a follow-up to the events we've all taken in over the past two weeks. After reviewing the news coverage regarding the memorial service of George Floyd, it is obvious to state that he did not have to die. His death, like others before him, has caused grief, anger, frustration, fear, and hopelessness for many. Because of the deep effects of systematic racism, our country is once again trying to make sense of senseless violence and relentless oppression and primarily at the, at the African-American community. Witnessing what has happened over these weeks, including an arrest in multiple cities, as communities plead for an end to racism and injustice against people of color, it is overwhelming to see the anguish etched on the faces of so many. To the workers within our county work family who are feeling pain and fear brought on by these deaths, I regret this and agree with you. Though I cannot fully comprehend the sadness and sorrow, I'm disheartened that yet again, our nation has failed to live up to its ideals and our communities have ignored infinite dignity of all of its members. It is noted that the events of the past week come in the middle of a glo global pandemic that is adding suffering and claiming lives disproportionately and keeping us apart when, would we when we would typically reach out to one another for comfort. As a workforce, we need to vow to support each other. I encourage us all to do our individual parts to stand together and address issues of social justice and drive our community to do better. We cannot ignore injustice or wish away, wish away racism and bigotry. Now more than ever, we, we, must be, we must confront hatred and uphold one another in times of great division and inequity. To quote John F. Kennedy, let us all pledge to quote, convert our good words into deeds and to quote, explore what, 
explore what problems unite us instead of belaboring those problems which divide us. I conclude by saying, as always, thank you for your part in providing the needed county services we provide to our citizens. Signed, Scott Elliott, County Manager. And I would like to, um, as I was doing some research on um, composing the comments I want to make the workforce, I'd like to, to give credit to where credit's due to um, the president of Wake Forest University and communication he made, um, Dr. Um, the president, Dr. Hatch, or Mr. Hatch, Nathan Hatch, and lifted a couple of his, his statements to, to compile this. But I uh, just wanted to, um, I've been asked by the chairman as I communicated this, provided this statement to the full board of commissioners. He asked me to read this for the full board's benefit in the public. With that, if we can move back to the recognition of our nine, is it nine or 11? 11, 11 foster, foster children. Jan, do you want to just come, make a brief comment? We had 11 foster children who graduated from high school. One of those graduated from early college. Many of them are going on to university or to Pitt Community College uh, in the fall. So we are excited about the, the, the success of these children and we wanted to, or young people actually, and wanted to share that with you. Thank you very much. Very good. Very good. Thank you very much, Ms. Allen. It was a very good presentation. Uh, anything else, Mr. Manager? Yes, sir. Next is your consent agenda. Okay. Items for consent. Can we get a, a motion for that? You have a hands up by Commissioner Albright, Ward, and White. Uh, Commissioner Albright. Yeah, my hand was up earlier. I'm sorry. Uh, I had a, a, a a comment and a question. I, I, I do appreciate that video. I was at the, that graduation and, and uh, it's a beautiful day and I'm, I'm glad for that occasion and for all the dedication from those young folks. I don't suppose Dr. Silvernail is still in the house. I was trying to raise my hand when he was here. Okay. Yes, sir, he is. Um, I, I'm interested in a comment from Dr. Silvernail about uh, uh, masks, uh, uh, what he might say about recommendations. Um, we ha we've heard some, some people, some comments that sounded like he was not recommending masks any longer. And uh, I think since the last time he was here, um, you know, things, might have, things have changed in our policy. And I'm just curious about what he has to say, comments or recommendations. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Silvernail. Good evening, Commissioner Albright. I do support the voluntary wearing of masks. Um, I have mine around my neck tonight. I didn't put it on when I came to the podium. Uh, I am wearing mine in public uh, and uh, my wife is not happy with me because I have made her wear hers while she is with me in public. Um, uh, there's growing evidence that it does help with decreasing the transmission uh, from one person to another. Uh, probably doesn't offer as much protection to you as the wearer as some people think. Um, but I do support the voluntary wearing of, of masks. Um, uh, the problem is the, the recommendate is the requiring. And I think sometimes when you require things, if you can't enforce the requirement uh, or don't provide an option to, um, to folks who may not tolerate masks uh, in that requirement that you, um, you can get into, into some difficulties. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I wonder, uh, Scott, are, 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 is anything happening with uh, 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 masking maybe when we're uh, inter interfacing with public do you not, can you tell us how masking is going on in you know, the, uh, the recommendation in the county? Well, as you're aware, Commissioner Albright, the board has dealt with this on a couple of occasions. And at one point we had a required masking policy. The board then reversed that. And it's now we are encouraging our employees um, 
to mask if um, they're in a situation where they can't appropriately social distance from another person. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, again, items now for consent. And then we have some hands up, Scott. Yeah, so you had, um, we've got Commissioner Albright, now you've got Commissioner Ward, White, and Nunley's hands up. Okay, Commissioner Ward. Um, I'd like to... I'd like to make a motion that we accept the uh, consent agenda. Okay. Uh, the second by anyone who was who was who was uh, next. Yes. Hands up. Yes, I was going to second the consent agenda, please. Very good, Miss White, second it. Okay. Let it be known now uh, by Madam Clerk. Will you please call the roll? Chairman McLawhorn? Yes. Vice Chair Colson? Yes. Commissioner Albright? Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick? Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins? Yes. Commissioner Nunnally? Yes. Commissioner Ward? Yes. Commissioner White? Yes. Commissioner Perkins Williams? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Manager, it, it looks as if uh, we can proceed on for the items of discussion, but maybe when we finish the items of discussion, maybe a five or 10 minutes break before we get to the items of decision. So uh, if we could, uh, Mr. Manager, item for discussion. Yes, sir. Your first item for discussion regards the CARES Act spending plan. As you are aware, the, the board has acted on this. Um, on June the 1st, we had submitted a plan to the state regarding Pitt County's um, allocation of $3.1 million, 3.2 rounded of CARES Act funding that had been passed from the federal government to the state and then allocated to counties. This was the first 150 million of $300 million of monies and the 150, Pitt County's portion of the first 150 million was 3.1 million. What, what is before you tonight is a um, request of Commissioner Vice Chairman Colson to rediscuss a portion of that allocation of funding, 478,000 that was set aside for the municipal allocation, which I think we had, was it six of 10, Brian? M municipalities had requested money. Right. Um, Maybe and, seven, but yeah. Pardon me? Could have been seven, six or seven. Yeah, six or seven. The majority. Um, six, actually, six. So um, I don't want to speak for Vice Chairman Colson, but I'll just maybe summarize and maybe he can he can step in. He is proposing to um, to change the municipal allocation and to take 100,000 to 478,000 and dedicate that tor towards additional monies towards testing and then take the remaining balance, 378,000, and to put that toward contingency. I don't know, Brian, if you would add anything before Vice Chairman Colson speaks. So that the, just from a procedural standpoint, um, any changes, we just need to submit the uh, spending plan back to the state for approval before we actually start spending or reimbursing ourselves for any uh, money outside of the plan that's already been submitted to the state, which you have a copy of that was submitted back on June the 1st. Okay, okay. Uh, again, Scott, uh, if you and Brian want to state your recommendation again for the benefit of the public, would you do so now? I'm going to go back to my recommendation of June the 1st to keep the, the allocations as, um, as allocated um, of the 3.2 million, the 15% going to the municipal allocation. And as we've pointed out, the municipalities um, are eligible just like the county is to apply, apply for federal FEMA funding under the public assistance category. And I think Brian has learned that the opportunities under that are pretty wide. You wanna maybe make a brief statement on that? Basically outside of testing and uh, regular pay for public safety and public health employees, pretty much everything that falls underneath the CARES Act is an eligible expense, um, has the potential to be reimbursed via FEMA through their public assistance program. And unlike the CARES Act where the county has one point, uh, excuse me, $3.1 million. 
Um, it's, to my knowledge, the, the FEMA public assistance funds will run until the event is closed out by the federal government, which is, as of right now, they do not have an end date. They also have a, a process to speed up reimbursement compared to their normal um, emergency situations. So uh, the municipalities have every right to uh, submit for reimbursement, just like the county will be doing to allow us to make our 3.1 million spread out as far as we can. The only modification I might make in my recommendation would be, would be A, to, to require the municipalities to apply for FEMA PA funding first, and second, to hold off on any reimbursements within that 478,000 until A, we've found that they've got a denial for the FEMA PA funding, and B, that we have made sure that our testing that we're gonna be doing around the county, that the amount of money we have allocated is appropriate for that, because we will be testing both within incorporated and non-incorporated areas, and if the, the current allocation, 1.2 million, I believe it is, if that's not sufficient, you might want to dip into these other areas to help um, shore that up. So I would, again, I would still recommend just holding the, the plan submitted to the state. And um, if anything, maybe just holding off on any consideration of, of um, reimbursements for, to the cities until we know better about testing to the, the volume of testing, the cost of testing. I know we have learned, I think Dr. Silvernell has reported to the Board of Health that we originally thought that the um, cost for the test to be analyzed would be about $100, $110 a test. That's now been negotiated and cut in half. So the, the number of tests we can do can greatly be expanded. So whether we will use all of the 1.2 million or maybe the demand will be so high we need $2 million of the, the 3.1 right now, I think that's undetermined until we actually get testing on the ground and see what the, the volume of demand is. Okay. Right now, Mr. Chairman, you have Vice Chairman Colson's hand up and Commissioner Albright. Okay, Vice Chair Chairman Colson. I'm, I'm sorry, they were sending unmuted. Is, is that me? Did you recognize me? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Well, one of the things that uh, had come up several times had been for more testing. And my proposal to move an extra hundred thousand dollars into the testing category uh, I think just covers that and regardless of what the price is going to be is I think that over the course of time a hundred thousand dollars is not going to be enough along with what it already has to be able to cover every citizen in Pitt County uh, the, the other part of this that I'd like to bring up and uh, that uh, when we had our health department uh, meeting uh, the uh, uh, Biden actually sent two representatives before us, and their proposal was is that they wanted to be able to do all the testing in in county uh, through them, and uh, they made a compelling case for it. But I asked a question as to what the cost was, and they did not even have an estimate as to what the cost was. And then uh, the, it, it was uh, related by Dr. Silvernell that costs have been taken down to $51. But three times it came up as to, well, what is the cost that you're going to charge? And they said, well, it'll be along whatever uh, FEMA. I, I'm, not, I'm not, not FEMA, but um, um, shoot. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, what, whatever is get reimbursed by, I'm sorry, what? Center for Medicaid Services, CMS? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's through Medicaid. And so uh, my question was, in my mind, I did not ask them this, but what if, what if uh, Medicaid is willing to pay $99? Are they expecting we, the county, to pay $99 for the service? And... So uh, th that really kind of went unanswered. The, but re regardless, the fact is, is even with the additional $100,000 and even with it being cut to $50, is it only goes for a finite number of tests and it won't even begin to touch the total population of Pitt County. As far as the rest of the money, I wanted it to go into contingency because I believe that we're going to be able to find enough internal costs to where I think that we were – we may have jumped the gun to be able to uh, signal or telegraph to the, the, the municipalities that we were going to send them $478,000, of which the vast majority of it goes to Greenville. 
uh, a, a much smaller amount goes to would, would go to Winterville, and then the other towns only ask for a handful of dollars. In talking with uh, Brian, as I asked him a question about what about our other counties that we compare ourselves to, and one of our favorite counties is where I come from, Iredell County, and uh, the two, two biggest towns in Iredell, Statesville and Mooresville, they asked for zero dollars. And there were many other counties that we compare ourselves to that only asked for a handful of dollars. They didn't ask for much. And Greenville asked for $1.6 million. And, and I think that, that that was telling right there as to what Greenville was really expecting out of this. And, you know, there, there's still going to be another $150 million out there. And how that get dis, gets dispersed, that's yet for the, to be decided by the by the um, legislature. But for now, I think that we ought to not send a signal that they're going to get any money based on we don't know what our total costs are going to be, consequently why I'm asking for the change. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Colsa. Commissioner Albright. Yeah, just real quickly, a question for Scott. Um, I, I thought I heard you say that with, with that you would be wanting a, a, a application to FEMA before the municipalities would be able to apply. And I, I guess that concerns me a little with the small towns and the, some of the small amounts that people were asking and if that might not be a, a, a burden that, that would not be necessary. Um, I, I don't believe that we ever decided how the money was going to be distributed either. That was my other comment. But thank you. Brian, I thought we did present to the board the, six, the allocation to the six municipalities, or did we not? We at that time we had not. Okay. Um, so it's, it's included in the packet that they have in front of them today. Okay. Which was what was submitted to the state. And on the FEMA question, I, I would tell uh, Commissioner Albright, um, all the municipalities have the ability to um, submit reimbursement directly to FEMA. Um, there's an online portal that FEMA has set up. If the municipalities have not already registered through FEMA, then I highly recommend that they do so. Um, it, it will take an hour or two, but I, I think due to their request, um, they should be able to, if they have copies of all of their invoices and receipts, to easily submit directly to FEMA. Thank, thank you for the clarification. There's really three options before you. One is to keep it as on page 52, your agenda package that shows the six municipalities the town of Aden getting allocation of 10,000, town of Bethel, $322.22, city of Greenville, 387,505.63, town of Grimesland, $700, town of Farmville, $26,035.90, town of Winterville, 54,048.05. Or another option would be, and um, this is kind of batted around the, the municipalities, would be just to take the 478,000 divided on a per capita basis among the population of those 10 municipalities so that if you have a municipality that maybe didn't see a need currently, but maybe there'd be one coming up between now and December 30th, which is the, the cutoff date on this, that they would have an allocation to um, consider going forward. So those are kind of the, the options you have before you. Okay, very good. And the pledge of the board, uh, we have any hands? Uh, Commissioner Ward. Commissioner Ward. Um, yeah, since um, we need a motion, correct? Well. Yes. And I mean, I wanted to support uh, to make the motion that we support the second alternative that our uh, manager reported so we can go on and send it into the state. Because my understanding is once we get the money, we can still make changes and tweak the information as to how we're going to spend the money. Mr. Ward, do you want it as is displayed on page 52 or on a per capita basis among all 10 municipalities? The one that you said at the end. So per capita amongst all 10 municipalities. Right, wasn't that your recommendation? Um, at this point, yes, I think that's a fair way. If you're gonna keep it the 478, the 15% allocated in all fairness, yes, to, uh, splitting it per capita amongst each of the 10 municipalities with their population. And again, keeping it capped at 478,000, that would um, be a fair distribution, especially for those municipalities that didn't ask for any money, but may have needs between now and the end of the calendar year. Correct. So I'm making a motion that we accept um, the second recommendation of the manager. 
Okay, very good. Thank you. Do we have a second on that? Um, you have hands up by Commissioner Floyd Huggins and Commissioner Perkins Williams. Commissioner uh, Floyd Huggins. Well, I had a question because uh, Beth was asking about the recommendation that the manager made. And the, I think the last one, uh, maybe it was the first one out now, he mentioned that uh, he would favor holding, um, keeping the um, the what the allocation as it is, but not distributing it until the municipalities have applied to FEMA. Isn't that what you said, um, Scott? Yeah. So I guess uh, not to speak words on the Commissioner Ward and her motion, but I, my recommendation would be to keep the fifteen percent of four hundred seventy-eight thousand, do a per capita split among all ten municipalities with the condition that A, they apply to FEMA for public assistance funding first, and that B, that we hold that money aside until you see what your true testing costs and demand for testing is gonna be, and then at some future point, maybe later after summer, fall, consider reimbursements to the municipalities if that money is not needed for funding county, you know, fund, funding testing countywide. Okay, so is that her, her motion? If so, I will second it. Um, okay. Commissioner, okay. Commissioner, 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 Has Commissioner, been Commissioner Perk Williams. I thought Beth was talking about the second option and I was going to second that because I really think since the municipalities may not know all of the conditions that they may have to face with COVID-19 that each, each, each municipality will have to turn something allocated but yet when it come up it'll be there and it I thought that's what Beth was asking for the second in her motion, and I was going to second that. But if that wasn't what she was asking, then I'm going to vote the other way. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Ward has her hand up. Commissioner Ward? Um, yes to Ann and yes to Mary, and I think that's what I said, right, Scott? <laughs> if what I said. The motion that I made included what Scott said. Yes, ma'am. So my answer to um, Ann and Mary is yes. Okay. You have a motion on the floor and has been second. Uh, no further discussion, Madam Clerk. You have Mr. Colson's hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we have Commissioner Colson's hand is up. Commissioner Colson, I'm sorry restate the motion uh i might be for it <laughs> the way but i'm confused there is so much going around circle madam clerk will you restate the motion please okay what i have is motion to split the <clears throat> funding in the amount of 478 60980 between the municipalities on a per capita basis and hold the money aside until true testing costs are known to pitt county uh, and, and and hold the true by the FEMA funding first for, for public assistance. Who, us or them? Them. Then they'll have to, to show us they've done that and they've been denied. And then um, the county would then consider. And we will be executing um, agreements with each of the 10 municipalities that stipulates under what conditions we will be reimbursing costs. And if their costs at some point at the end of the day are um, denied by the state or federal government, they will then hold the county harmless because we'll be receiving this money then be dispersing it directly to the municipalities. Mr. Chairman, if I All could right. add, it is a requirement of the program that they submit their expenses to FEMA first before they're eligible under the CARES Act. And so while that's a request and would be a requirement within the agreement, it's also something that they have to do under the law. Okay, thank you for that clarification. We're ready to vote, Madam Clerk. Chairman McLaughlin? Yes. Oh, we have Commissioner Nunley's hand up. I'm sorry. Commissioner Nunley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Scott, just a question about um, the, the, I guess, the per capita breakdown. Um, and I guess I'm at, I guess I question whether or not that's even necessary if we're able to come back to come back to the table. If, if, if we keep things the way they are, the municipalities have already kind of looked at their response plans um, would 
I guess, does, does us doing this cause another level of kind of inquiry that's not really necessary from that part? It's just really a, a, an ask of caution and are we not, are we per, potentially creating more um, bureaucracy whereas they've already thought through it or, or, or is this really just providing an easier opportunity in the event that, uh, that they do need those additional funds? I think for the municipalities, it's a question of, of fairness and also just to making sure for future needs. In my weekly um, Wednesday calls with the municipalities and other partner agencies, we have discussed this um, in some, some point of detail. And my, my feeling is, and the county attorney that is on these calls can agree or disagree, that the majority of them favored the per capita allocation basis that we're that the motion that's before you tonight. That's right. They preferred the per capita because they were concerned about unknown expenses at this time. Okay. Thank you. Very good. All right. Ready? Um, Madam Clerk. Okay. Chairman McLaughlin. Yes. Vice Chair Colson. Yes. Commissioner Albright. Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Yes. Commissioner Nunnally? Yes. Commissioner Ward? Yes. Commissioner White? No. Commissioner Perkins Williams? Yes. Motion passes eight to one. Very good. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda, uh, Scott, relocation of the Confederate session. Mr. Chairman, so you, you have the relocation of the Confederate statue at the Pitt County Courthouse on the agenda, as I think the board is well, as well aware as the public. Commissioner Nunley has asked for this topic to be placed on your items for discussion for tonight's agenda. And um, we do have some information um, in your budget workshops. Commissioner Nunley had init initially asked for some for staff to gather some information regarding the cost that would be associated with um, removing the, the monument. So our county attorney, Tim Corley, has um, been busy at work compiling these costs and getting these, these estimates. Now I'm gonna turn it over to him for a short presentation on this specific portion of this discussion, if you'll allow that. And then okay. I think Commissioner Nunley has his hand up. Unless you wanna to refer to Commissioner Nunley first, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Com Commissioner Nunley first. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and I, and Tim, I guess we can hear from you uh, in a moment, but I just wanted to briefly, um, discuss, I guess, what, what this is all about and that hopefully today Pitt County will firmly plant its foot in the 21st century and, and deny the tyranny of a repressive and unequal past to dictate and symbol reflect here in Pitt County any longer. Um, and in order to write its own promising future, um, it's my hope that today Pitt County, um, it, we must tear down the bandage of nostalgia for an inglorious and immoral history um, of racism and the systematic denial of equal rights uh, to uh, all under the law. Um, we, the people of Pitt County, black, white, and all different shades in between, and when we're humble, you know, we really own our perspectives and self-reflect. And we're honest about our faults as well as our triumphs. Uh, we grow and we grow together um, into the best and strongest versions of ourselves. And today we heard from a number of citizens and hopefully it marks one day of many where our better future is and will be written, uh, where the promise of our forebears um, begins to bend with that strident and righteous arc of justice, ensuring that the promise that's emboldened in our Constitution and our Declaration of an Inclusive America, that expands to all of our people, um, that they're created equal, um, that they're endowed with the right to life, uh, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, today, we'll hopefully move um, to take down a symbol of a racist past, um, not because we hate, but because we begin to reconcile and because we love. Uh, we love the county we're becoming. We love the people we're becoming by acknowledging how much better we will be together by systematically dismantling a culture built on the subjugation of minorities 
for the privileging of a white majority. Um, and, and so in the spirit of that effort tonight, I, I respectfully move at the beginning of this conversation that county staff, uh, for the purpose of ensuring that public safety um, immediately remove, um, this is a would be for immediate removal of the United Daughters of Confederacy statue, which was erected at the Pitt County Courthouse in 1914 in memorial to the cause of the Confederacy. Um, that if, upon its removal, um, it be stored and secured within the county uh, until such time that it may be appropriately relocated or otherwise dispatched pursuant to law. Um, and that, that the where and what to do with that memorial, that conversation really is for another day. Um, but that, that really today, that, that, that my motion is to take it down immediately. Okay, very good. Thank you, Commissioner Nunley. Do we have a second to that? You have Commissioner Floyd Huggins hand up. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Second. Has been moved and properly second uh, at this time. And of course, we will have a discussion uh, after, after the vote. Uh, Madam Clerk. Chairman, you do have two hands up um, Commissioner White and Commissioner Ward. Commissioner White. Yes, um, we can all agree with the concept of relocating the statue at the courthouse and that maybe the courthouse is not the most suitable place for the monument. After talking with many people across the county, I think a relocation would be a fair compromise for everyone involved. So I would like to make a substitute motion that um, we decide on a place to relocate it and then move it to that location since we cannot legally store it for more than 90 days according to the state statute. And we do have an oath to uphold the law. Um, and I mean, I'm open to having a special called meeting um, next week to get feedback from county staff on an appropriate location to relocate this monument. Okay. And do we have a second on that? Uh, do you have a hand up? Commissioner Vice Chairman Colson. Vice Chairman Colson. I second uh, Lauren's uh, motion. Okay, it has been moved and properly second on that. Um, Ward's hand up. A commissioner Ward. Uh, I was gonna second the motion, thank you. Okay, we have two motion on, on the floor. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, what's the procedure and and we're ready to vote. So we will vote on the substitute motion first, which is to relocate the Confederate statue at the Pitt County Courthouse. That's the substitute motion made by, by Commissioner White. Yes, sir. Okay. Chairman. The hand up first. Um, Commissioner Nunley's hand up, Commissioner Perkin Williams' hand up, Commissioner Ward's hand up. Okay, Commissioner Nunley and Commissioner who? Commissioner Nunley. Point, point of clarification, thank you, Mr. Um, Mr. Chair. Point of clarification, the my initial motion uh, was for the immediate removal um, of, of the statue um, um, for the purpose of relocation or um, appropriate dispatch pursuant to law. Um, and that would be in a, for immediate removal. Um, and the substitute motion is for not immediate removal, but that to delay and to have a further discussion on this at another time. If, if, I'm, if, if it is not a motion for relocation this evening. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lemmer. What? What's the other hand, uh, manager? Commissioner Ward, Commissioner, Commissioner Ward. Ward. Commissioner White. And Commissioner White. Commissioner Ward. Um, I think that we are very close to the same motion. Um, I'm not exactly sure, um, Commissioner Nunley. Um, I support the taking down and removing but I also support, and I thought you said this, but then when you restated it, you did not to have it uh, find a place to relocate it in the county. 
Okay. And the Okay, the I just clarification on that. Do, do you understand what he said, Mr. Ward? What I'm saying is if the motion is to take the statue down and to begin looking for a relocation place in the county for the statue, um, you know, as soon as we can, um, then yes, okay. that's I've, the motion, but I'm asking if that's the motion. I lean towards um, Lauren's motion if that is not Chris's motion. I think that is Chris's motion, uh, Chris Nunley motion for immediate removal. So that is a, that is what you stated. All right, who, who's next in line, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman? Help me, Madam Clerk. And Perkins, Perkins Williams. Perkins Williams. Let's go, Commissioner Perkins. Perkins. Commissioner Perkins Williams. That sort of covered what I was trying to find out between the two motions is that we, we remove it and with, if we remove it, we're going to need to clean it up or something or whatever, but that it be placed, uh, uh, we remove it immediately and place it and, and then we will work on it. I think Lauren's is to delay um, uh, removing it until you find a place. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. In the other hand, Ms. Manager. Yes, you still have up, um, I'm not sure the order. Um, White, okay, Commissioner White. Nunley, then Nunley Coulson. and Colson. White, Nunley, Colson. Commissioner White. Yes, um, I mean, we need to have a, a place to relocate at first. And it's my understanding that it would take a couple of weeks for the company to be able to come and move it down. It would be my hope that we could have a special called meeting to meet back and get feedback from county staff so that we can vote on a relocation spot. Because according to state statute, we cannot put it in a museum. We cannot move it to a cemetery. You know, there are certain guidelines that we have to follow. And I just want to be sure that we're in the realm of the law. So I am for relocating it, but I think that we need to have a plan in place for the location of it first before we actually take it down. Okay. All right. Uh, next, Ms. Manager, who was it? Vice Chair Colson. Vice Chair Colson. Uh, as Lauren just stated, that's you know her 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 motion never said to delay it. Uh, that's somebody's reading into that. I believe that uh, we'd all be in favor of moving it very quickly if it's possible and and to move it someplace. I'm concerned about costs. Uh, as, as if if we move it to a warehouse and then have to move it again, you got two moves in it. And both moves are going to cost about the same amount, probably would cost the same amount. And so it, it needs to go somewhere. If we're going to vote to put it in the warehouse, I'm going to vote no. Because visions of the late Raiders of the Lost Ark come to mind. And the warehouse where they, they put uh, the Ark of the Covenant, is it's going to be in that warehouse somewhere. And it will never see the light of day again. It will be out of sight, out of mind. Lauren's motion, the way I took it, is that we will get, you know, we'll have a special called meeting. We'll talk about, we'll have numbers by that time from, you know, as far as the cost. And hopefully within just a few days or a week, we'll be able to have people that are willing to actually accept it. So it should save money. And I think Chris is kind of reading into it something that was not intended with uh, Lauren's motion. Okay. Uh, That's well, all. Thank you very much. Who's next, Ms. Manager? You still have, uh, you had, you have Nellie and Perkins Williams. And I just I want to remind the board that our county engineer has some information regarding cost of moving it, the timing of removing it, a couple of factors you may want to can take into consideration before voting on either a substitute or the main motion. Okay, very good. So Why don't we hear from our engineer now, and then then we'll hear the hear the the other two. Okay. 
Why don't you speak? Mr. Chair, um, meaning, good evening to the board. Um, I do have a little bit of information. I'll talk a little bit about the logistics of actually um, of getting that statue taken down as well as um, reassembled at a different location. Um, it was very challenging uh, this past week to try to talk with uh, different marble companies and also crane companies to try to coordinate um, what it would cost to actually move uh, this, this statue and, and take it down. Um, just a little bit of uh, information about the statue. Um, it's approximately 27 foot tall. It's, it's rather rather tall. Um, the heaviest piece is estimated to be approximately 2,500 pounds, which is over a ton. Um, so it will take a crane, a fairly large size crane to get it down. Uh, the access is also an issue. Uh, the crane will have to sit on the roadway. Uh, so that we'll have to, uh, it's a good distance from the actual uh, monument itself. So it'll have to be a larger crane as a result of that. Uh, the statue is made up of mostly granite um, contacted 12 different companies uh, across North Carolina uh, from basically from the Triangle East. Um, a lot of those had concerns about the removal. Um, either they were not interested or uh, expressed concern about it being removed, period. Um, they get three bids. Um, one of those, uh, actually two of those being Pitt County bids and one from the Triangle area. Uh, company A was uh, 25500 dollars to this is just to take it down and to take it to a storage facility 20% um, additional to perform that immediately I was told that most of these individuals most of these companies have uh, about a two week uh, scheduling period sometimes longer and to move it up in their schedule um, all of them pretty much said that they would need additional monies to, to push back other items in their schedule uh, the next bid was $39,750 and the third bid was $325,000 uh, for storage, as it relates to storage, uh, off-site storage is estimated to be between $250 to $300 a month. That's to take it to a storage facility somewhere in Pitt County. Uh, we do have uh, one on-site location um, identified within the county, the on-county grounds that uh, may be appropriate for uh, locating uh, the monument. Uh, probably not for forever, but at least uh, for the time being, if, if need be. And then uh, finally, uh, as far as the logistics to reassemble it, um, there is the process of creating a new foundation for that. Uh, obviously, it's very heavy. Uh, and so there's time involved in uh, first identifying where that location would be, uh, securing a contractor to install that foundation, uh, and then uh, actually reassembling the, the monument at that location. Uh, those total costs are estimated between 60 and $70,000, and that includes the, um, the foundation as well. So uh, just some logistics there as you consider, uh, as you talk through, through uh, the motions that have been made uh, for your consideration. Okay, thank you very much. Um, was there any questions, comments on that, Mr. Manager? Yes, yeah, so you have, um, you had Commissioner Nunley's hand up, and you also have Perkins Williams and Floyd Huggins as well. Commissioner Nunley. I'm just going to call the question on the substitute motion. Okay. The question has been called. I think we have talked about this enough and we're ready to vote. Um, Madam Clerk. Okay. So the substitute motion is to relocate the Confederate statute at the Pitt County Courthouse. Chairman McLawhorn. No. Vice Chair Colson? Yes. Commissioner Albright? No. Commissioner Fitzpatrick? No. Commissioner Floyd Huggins? Uh, no. Commissioner Nunnally? No. Commissioner Ward? No. Commissioner White? Yes. Commissioner Perkins Williams? No. Fail seven to two. We will move to the original motion. 
which is to immediately remove the Confederate statue at the Pitt County Courthouse and store and secure within the county until a relocation site is selected. Mr. Chairman, you have two hands up also uh, for Float Huggins and Ward. Okay, well, we have a motion. Uh, we've discussed this, uh, we'll get back to it. Let's go with the motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, in terms of the motion as uh, made by Commissioner Nunley, in terms of the reference to public safety, I feel like it, it's probably um, prudent to regarding <laughs> public safety as a public official. I just wanted to say that um, based upon my observation and in, and in consultation with law enforcement, I've determined that the Confederate monument and the courthouse property poses a threat to public safety and creates a dangerous condition for the property, law enforcement, and citizens in the community. And I'd like to further state that I base this determination on the fact that the Confederate monument has been vandalized with paint. The flagpoles on either side of the monument were pulled down and damaged. The flag pole was the, the flag beside the monument was burned on the street beside the monument. I've also observed the courthouse property and the monument are currently guarded with barricades. Over the last weeks, we've had riots and violence in downtown Greenville, uptown Greenville, around the monument and the courthouse resulting in significant property damage. This was to the extent the National Guard and many other law, law enforcement agencies responded to provide protection. I've been told by law enforcement that there have been credible threats of further violence to the monument and courthouse property. All these conditions lead me to believe that the statue poses a threat to the public safety because of these unsafe and dangerous conditions. Okay, very like good. Added into the record um, as this motion is based upon partly upon public safety as well as other factors. Very good. Thank you for, for, for that information. Madam Clerk. Chairman McLawhorn? Yes. Vice Chair Colson. I'm thinking. I know we can't do it. I'm going to vote no. Commissioner Albright? Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick? Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins? Yes. Commissioner Nunnally? Yes. Commissioner Ward? Yes. Commissioner White? No, simply because I don't think it state statue allows to store without a relocation site. Commissioner Perkins Williams. Yes. Motion passes seven. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Manager and uh, Madam Attorney, you all again, I think it was stated that you we work at, working on a place to have it uh, appropriately located until such time we can get it permanent. Is that correct? Yes, it would be stored until a, a location that is determined at some future date. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, item number, th number three, uh, Scott. The item number three is an, entitled Enlargement of the Greenville Human Relations Commission or Council. And we've got a, again, this is a request from Commissioner Nunley on this item on page um, 56 of your agenda package. And we'll probably turn this to Commissioner Nunley for comment. Okay. Commissioner Nunley. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, keep it brief. I know y'all are surprised about that. Um, this <laughs> is really just asking for board direction to engage in conversations with the city of Greenville um, there's a current human relations council. We're not asking to recreate the will here, will here, but um, really uh, see if we can we can talk to city staff about um, getting a further uh, footprint out into Pitt County and the, a, an opportunity for the various municipalities and, and also our unincorporated areas uh, to get some representation and potentially expand that board so we really reach the entire county. So. It's not really uh, create any new new commission, but really just work with the city on creating one that'll touch all the residents of the county. And that, and it's, this is just a request for. Um, and so I would move to um, just to give staff direction to to start those conversations with city and come back and report at a later date. Okay. 
All right, yeah, it's been moved. Do we have a second on here? Um, Commissioner Ward has her hand up. It's been up for a while. I'm not sure if it's for this or a previous. Commissioner Ward? Yes. It, it was not to second this motion. It was to uh, say that I think we need to make a, um, get a committee or get a group uh, of commissioners and some other people who are interested to start immediately finding an appropriate place to have the statue placed. I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Uh, Manager and and, uh, and and our county attorney, you're you're going to be doing that. Am I correct? We uh, uh, maybe defer the attorney on. Yeah, so as I understood the last motion, it was to immediately remove the statue to store it until a plan could be in place. And then there were questions as to whether or not staff would be working on that plan. Um, we right. would, in conjunction with the commissioners, follow directions to establish a process for that plan. Yeah, we would need subsequent action as to what direction you would give us for that, um, what you would want, whether a committee is created or what type of plan for its relocation, some type of direction from the board. That can be tonight, or if you want to think about that and come back to the next meeting, either way. In the meantime, we would take steps to go ahead and have the, the monument um, removed from the courthouse. Well, uh, Scott, uh, can, can you and uh, the uh, our, our county attorney uh, get some uh, get a committee or uh, formulate that within staff to, 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 to decide how we will move forward on that? I really think this is... Um, probably on a higher level. I mean, I, the staff can direct can be involved and help support a committee effort, but I would recommend it be more on the elected level with us participating. Have staff and both elected officials part of that committee yes. so we have a clear understanding of the will of the board. Yes. Okay. Very good. We'll, we'll proceed with that. So we would need either a motion tonight or a motion next meeting for that committee to be created and then um, you could make it so that the, the chairman and the manager come up with a proposed list of committee members and bring that before back before the board for the full board's consideration. Yeah, I, I think that's that's what we need to move on that. So you have a number of hands up. Um, I'm not sure what order they went up, but you Albright, Lord Huggins, Ward, and Nunley. Okay, Commissioner Albright. The motion. Which motion? So we have a motion on the floor by Chris Nunnally about the- Yes, that, the Chris Nunnally motion, yes. Okay. To send a uh, discussion uh, about the Human Relations Committee uh, to staff to talk to the city of Greenville. Okay. Then you have- um, Yes, you about the statue. I don't know. Floyd Huggins, Ward, and Nunnally's hands are up. Okay, Floyd Huggins. Right, well, let me see which way I'm going. Um, Albright second Nunley's uh, motion about the committee for the human relation, uh, right? That's correct. That's okay. correct. Okay. Uh, well, I was going to make a motion to uh, ask the chairman to work with the manager and the attorney and to form a committee to help with the relocation. That was what I, my motion was going to be. Which was the same, if, Mr. Chairman, if I may, which I think is a similar motion to what Ms. Ward has attempted to do. And what I'd advise you to do is to, um, if you have a motion and a second relative to the Human Relations Council, I would mm -hmm. put those two attempt those two motions related to the statue, um, just to the side for a moment. Finish your discussion as it relates to Human Relations Council. Vote on the motion that's on the floor, and then provide an opportunity for another motion to be made with regard to the statue. Yes, that was uh, that was where I was going. Uh, and I, I think it was just um, it's sometimes difficult in the uh, electronic format to know who to call on in what order for flow. Right. So I think we hold those two items until we finish um, the Human Relations Council motion. If there's any further discussion on Human Relations Council, now would be the time to put your hand up. 
Okay, are there any further discussion on the human relation motion? You have two hands up, assuming they're about the Human Relations Council, um, Commissioner Ward, Commissioner Perkins Williams. Okay, Commissioner Ward and Commissioner Perkins Williams. Commissioner Ward. Um, we went through this a few years ago when the um, with the Human Relations um, Commission um, bringing in the county and the city. And at that time, the county um, chose to, that we have our own group in that order. And um, as far as human relations are concerned, uh, our own committee or our group that works on that. And um, I just am not in favor of revisiting that. And that was just what I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Perkins Williams. Beth, you threw me off. <laughs> you, you are not in favor of revisiting what? Uh, uh, could you clarify? Because I did have a. You said I wanted to understand what Commissioner Ward was saying because I had something else. Commissioner Ward's hand is back up, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Commissioner Ward, will you restate that for, for Commissioner Perkins Williams, please? Yes, I was. We visited this a while back, this Human Relations Committee. Um, we went to uh, two or three meetings. Um, one time it was uh, back when I was chair, and we decided as a county, the county commissioners voted, we have uh, committees such as this that function in the county. And instead of going in with uh, the one that the city was establishing, and that was all I was saying. So I really wouldn't be in favor of doing this, revisiting this. Okay, Commissioner. You, uh, you don't want to revisit that last line of what got me. Uh, you don't want to revisit establishing a committee Joining in the committee that's already established, I think we have our human relations. Um, we have a group that deals with that in the county. And, and it was a good while back that the city and the county, they were, we were trying to decide to join that group and it was decided not to. So are you saying that we should have our own committee to see and, and look at both whether we want to join, have a committee to, from, from this board to see if we want to join the other or see if it's best for us to create a countywide human relations committee? I think the county human relations committee, um, Scott, I'm trying, I'm struggling for the name of the uh, committee or the group. Um, I don't know whether it came through social services. I'm not sure what, but anyway, I feel like that it's, it's it, the county needs and the city needs are very different as far as that is concerned. Well, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm in favor of being a part of the committee representing the county for the Human Relations Council, and we should pursue it uh, because if we had a Human Relations Council, some of the issues that we're having to deal with, we could give it to the Human Relations Council. I did send uh, information forward to all members of the committee as it relates to Raleigh's uh, presentation that we had when I first came to the board and others. And I know Greenville uh, City has a Human Relations Council, but I, I wanted to us to look at it with a fresh set of eyes and maybe have a committee who would look at the Human Relations Council for Pitt County government. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Chairman, if I can just follow up on Commissioner Ward's comments. This topic has came before the board um, in 1999 and then I think 2014 and 15. I think what Commissioner Ward was um, alluding to was back in the 
2014-15 timeframe, um, some of the rationale to not join in with the city of Greenville with their human relations commission was that it was felt at that time by the current board that sat at that time that a lot of the functions that we perform in veteran services or HR or through our mission statement, through our values and, and priorities, those different things were, were um, compiled to um, make a, a rational or unrational justification that we actually do human relations via how we operate and perform as an organization that we have 35 or 45 different boards, commissions and committees that, that deal with different things. We don't have a direct human relations component that is strictly defined as, as um, Commissioner Nunley is suggesting tonight. I just wanted to add that kind of um, background. Okay, and that's why, 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 uh, why the committee was recommended to discuss this and come up with a, a format a formulation to proceed forward, uh, according to Commissioner Nunley. And you have Commissioner Nunley, Ward, and Ford Huggins hands up. And Commissioner Nunley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just just to um, just to clarify, and, and I've had a number of conversations with some sitting city council people about this. Um, and really see, um, you know, as it, as it applies to human relations, this is, this is kind of like, um, you know, if you, if you play baseball, it's kind of like soft toss. It's a really easy situation for the city and county to come together um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a moment of, of unity to show that we're all working um, to, 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 to betterment. And, and no one's given up anything. This is really just, and, and a lot, no, no really work on the county or the county's dime either. We're talking about, you know, just asking the city, having sit, our staff go to the city and say, hey guys, let's come up with a plan um, so that we're able to, to get that representation um, throughout the county. And uh, so, so that, that, would be the, that would be the motion is just that, you know, that we, that we just don't reinvent the wheel. Or we get an opportunity to get representation across the board uh, we're not duplicating services. I think as we're growing. Um, we need to make sure that we're working with our municipalities, and this is putting everyone under the same roof. So hopefully, that's that's really the reason for the call and 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 for the hopeful the board direction tonight uh, that our put that staff on that direction. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chairman, you've got Ward, Floyd Huggins, and Perkins Williams. Okay, uh, Commissioner Ward. If um, Mary Perkins Williams makes that motion that we form our own human relations board for Pitt County, I would like to second that motion. Okay. Commissioner uh, Perkins Williams. Well, that shut me down. Okay, I will make the motion that uh, the Pitt County Board of Commissioners establish a uh, an investigative committee relating to how we would structure what we would do and look into the human relations committee and come back and make a recommendation to the board. Commissioner Huggins, we uh, moving properly second. Commissioner Huggins. Uh, I thought we had, what was Chris Nunley's motion that we second? We had a motion on the floor. That, that's correct. Mr. Chairman, you had a motion on the floor to engage in discussions with the city of Greenville to expand the Human Relations Council. That motion was properly seconded. Then you had a substitute motion by Mary to create form a committee to consider a Pitt County Human Relations Council, which was seconded by Beth Ward. Okay. Okay, uh, again, restate this first motion made, please. By Chris Nunley. A uh, motion for staff to engage in discussion with the city of Greenville in regard to enlargement of the Greenville Human Relations Commission. Okay. And the su substitute motion. Uh, the substitute motion was for the Pitt County Board of Commissioners to establish their own Human Relations Commission. Create an investigative committee for Pitt County's own human and bring it back to the board for a report or correct. Okay. 
Uh, we're voting on the substitute motion first. Yes, sir. And okay. You have three hands that you can either address or vote. Ward Perkins Williams, who was the third one? Uh, Mr. N Commissioner Nunnally's hand just went down, I believe. Okay. So hey, Commissioner Nunnally. Hey, his went back up. Okay. Nunley Ward Perkins Williams. Nunley, Commissioner Nunley. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just point of discussion on the on this second motion, and certainly in the spirit of of Ms. Perkin Williams' motion, I do feel it's important that that we have a human relations commission. Um, I just feel very strongly as we're as we're looking to grow and partner with our with our municipalities that we don't do it in a duplicative effort. Um, that we're not we're not expending uh, county resources to do something that's already being done, um, and take an opportunity to work with with something that's already uh, very vibrant and work at at really working um, to build upon that um, as a partnership. And so that would be the that would be the reason in support of my primary motion, and not not against um, Mary per se, but Mary respectfully. I think it's better that we work with what we've already got than than to create a new one whole hog. Commissioner Ward. I, 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 I have already uh, said what I wanted in support of the motion that Mary made by seconded it, the substitute motion. So I'm ready to vote on that whenever the time comes. Okay. Commissioner Perkins, will you then we're ready to vote? Yes, I am ready to vote, but I wanted uh, Mr., uh, Commissioner Nunley to know that it would have been nice if you had sent out all of the information, what Green Deal City, how it's structured and everything like that. So I said, if we had a committee, like Scott said, to investigate and then come back and make a recommendation to the board, it's not, uh, that, that would be good because um, it's hard getting information from the city when you live in the county. I live in the rural area. So it's structure, how it be structured, and how it will issues be addressed, and how many, and that sort of things are questions for me. I call for the question. Okay, we're ready to vote. Uh, Madam Clerk. Ballhorn. Uh, yeah, I, I think in light of what, what, I, what I've heard, I'll vote for the substitute motion. Yes. Okay. Vice Chair Colson. No. Commissioner Albright. No. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. <clears throat> no. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Uh, I'm, I want to vote for both of them, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, because I do think that you need to talk. <clears throat> Uh, you know, with the city, and it doesn't mean that you have to take what they, what they are doing. So I'm going to vote no on the substitute. Okay, Commissioner Nunnally. No. Commissioner Ward. Yes. Commissioner White. No. Commissioner Perkins Williams. Yes. A motion fails six to three. Okay. Thank you. Now the original motion. Uh, Chairman McLawhorn. Yes. Vice Chair Colson. No. Commissioner Albright. Yes. Commissioner Patrick? Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins? Yes. Commissioner Nunnally? Yes. Commissioner Ward? No. Commissioner White? No. Commissioner Perkins Williams? No. That says five to four. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. 
Now, at this time, we'll have a 10 minutes break, Scott. Okay, Mr. Chairman, it's five minutes till nine. We'll come back at 9.05. 9.05, right.
Stand by everyone. We will resume the meeting in one minute. One minute. The Pitt County Board of Commissioners are resuming after a brief break from their Monday, June 15th meeting. Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back over to you. We'd like to, to suggest a roll call and then possibly to proceed back to the unfinished business about creating a committee for the um, um, statue of, of how to deal with its um, replacement once it's taken down. So if the clerk will do a roll call first. Chairman McLawhorn. Here. Vice Chair Colson. Here. Commissioner Albright. Here. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Here. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Here. Commissioner Nunnally. Here. Award. Present. Commissioner White. Here. Commissioner Perkins Williams. Here. Chairman, you you did have um, before your motion on the Human Relations Commission two motions. Neither one received a second. One was by Commissioner Ward. That was by Commissioner Floyd Huggins to possibly consider creating some type of a committee to work for staff and commissioners or whoever the chairman may want to appoint on that committee to work on a relocation relocation plan for where to put the monument after it's dismantled. It's put in storage, but after it's taken out of, if it, where to place it after being in storage. And you have um, Commissioner Nunley's hand up. Mr. Chairman. Okay, Commissioner Nunley. I was gonna um, second um, Commissioner and Floyd Huggins uh, motion. Okay. Has been moving properly. Second. Any, any other comments? Mr. Chairman, can you um, have the allow the clerk to read that motion? I'm sorry. Can you allow the clerk to read the, the motion? Yes, certainly. Motion, um, motion to create a committee to determine the relocation of the monument. Would it be for the chairman to appoint a committee? Mr. Chairman, yes. I, I, the the motion was by um, Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Yes. Now you were stating the motion. We you state that motion again clearly. I think it was kind of muffled. The motion again. Okay. The motion that I have is to create a committee to determine the relocation of the monument. Okay. Mr. Chairman, interpret that to be for Ms. Manager work with you as the chairman of the board to create a committee, appoint a committee, report back to the board um, to deal with where to relocate the monument after it's been put into storage. To, okay. After it's been in temporary storage. Very good. And so that is the motion and it's been second. All right, well, we're ready to vote. Madam Clerk. Chairman McLawhorn. Yes. Vice Chair Colson. Yes. Commissioner Albright. Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Yes. Commissioner Nunnally. Yes. Commissioner Ward. Yes. White. 
Yes. Commissioner Perkins. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Very good. Item six, full decision. Uh, Brian Barnett. Um, each fiscal year, as we uh, approach the end of June, um, we look to do final budget amendments to square up all of our funds. Um, it has been our practice that uh, with our fire districts, uh, we do have a budget set in place for the amount of revenue from their fire uh, tax rate. Um, at the end of, as we close the fiscal year, we do ask for a budget amendment to move all monies that are collected for each fire department into their budget. Um, as we close out the year. So what we have presented before you in order to close out this fiscal year, uh, we have $219,250 divided amongst the various fire districts that we would like a budget amendment to be able to appropriate the above budgeted uh, ad valorem tax revenue to each uh, respective fire district. Okay, thank you. What's the pledge of the board? You have a Hand up by Commissioner Perkins Williams and Commissioner Ward. Commissioner Perkins Williams. We um, approve. Okay, Commissioner Ward. We're uh, we're making the motion. Yes. I would like to make the motion, or if Mary made it, I'll second it. Okay, that's been moved and properly second. No other discussion, Madam Clerk. Chairman McLaughlin? Yes. Vice Chair Colson? Yes. Commissioner Albright? Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick? Yes. Boyd Huggins? Yes. Commissioner Nunnally? Yes. Commissioner Ward? Yes. Commissioner White? Yes. Commissioner Perkins? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, Brian, you up again. Okay, uh, we have another year-end budget amendment. Um, it's, it's earlier tonight and during the consent agenda, you did approve the uh, finance department working with the manager to do any work that we need to fix any um, of our operating funds as long as the amounts do not exceed $100,000. Um, in this case, um, I'm projected in the EMS fund that expenses will exceed revenues. Um, the shortfall is due to decline in our EMS transport revenues, capital purchases, and personnel costs. In order to, in order for funds uh, to ex not to exceed revenues, we will need a transfer from the general fund. Of, I'm projecting $425,000 in order for the EMS fund not to exceed uh, expenses. Very good. Uh, it's a pleasure of the board. Hand up from Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Move to approve. Very good. Do we have a second, Scott? Commissioner Nudley. Commissioner Nudley. Second. Okay, that's been moving properly. Second, Madam Clerk. Chairman McLaughlin. Yes. Vice Chair Colson. Yes. Commissioner Albright. Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins? Yes. Commissioner Nunnally? Yes. Commissioner Ward? Yes. White? Yes. Commissioner Perkins Williams? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Demery, you up? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, members of the board, Central Carolina Holdings, uh, which provides our tire and recycling disposal for Pitt County has done so since uh, the late nineties. They are the only place around close enough for us to dispose of our tires and recycle our tires. We've had a long relationship with this company and it's been satisfactory. Uh, our current five-year contract um, expired May 31st, 2020. However, uh, Central Carolina Holdings has extended the contract additional month at the current rate to allow the contract, the new contract, 
if approved to begin on July 1st, um, 2020. The current rate for tire disposal and, and transportation is currently at $77.46 per ton. Um, Central Carolina Tire is asking for the following new prices. The new, the new price will be $79 per ton for disposal, a $600 freight per load, plus a fuel surcharge of what we're paying now, an additional 19 cents per pound for off-road tires, and five cents a pound for large truck tires. And there also will be a $15 environmental fee for every trip. Um, and in this contract, they're asking for an annual CPI increase every July. The contract has been um, proposed for one year to allow staff to find a less expensive alternate for our tire disposal. I have, um, I have contacted a place in uh, Franklin in North Carolina or Franklin County that does some recycling and we just, uh, we, we need to continue the conversation with them. Um, but there's not the closest other tire landfill is in the western part of the state and they won't come this far. We do receive money from the state to cover our cost for tires. However, next year, I'm not sure what the state's gonna do. I've asked them, they can't tell me anything if the, if the amount of money that we receive from them is going up. And I'm projecting and I budgeted too for this additional cost of $150,000 next year for tire disposal. So I'm asking that uh, you allow the county manager to execute the one year renewal contract for tire disposal with Central Carolina Holdings and um, be glad to answer any questions with the price increases, excuse me. Thank you very much. We have a hand, Mr. Manager. Um, not this time, Mr. Chairman. We have Commissioner Nunley's hand up. Uh, Commissioner Nunley. Move to accept the recommendation. Okay, do we have a second? Uh, Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Commissioner Huggins. Second. That's been moving properly. Second, Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk. Sir, Chairman McLawhorn. Yes. Vice Chair Colson. Yes. Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Yes. Commissioner Nunnally. Yes. Commissioner Ward. Yes. White. Yes. Perkins Wheat. Yeah. Um, yes. Motion passes unanimously. Very good. Uh, Trans transfer of assets of, of the Kennewick area sewer project. Um, one item before that, the press increase in contract for with Republic Services. Okay, I'm sorry, I did miss that. Okay, Mr. Denver, you up again? All righty, um, we send our municipal solid waste to Eastern Carolina Environmental Landfill, which is owned by Republic Services to Bertie County, which is located in Bertie County. The current contract has a clause to increase the rate annually based on the consumer price increase for garbage and trash. The CPI rate is 0.16%. Uh, With that, the new rate, will in which includes a $2 per ton tax, um, will go from $35.95 to $36. So we're seeing an increase of five cents a ton. And that was uh, incorporated in our um, budget for uh, disposal cost was the new rate. And so staff's recommending the increase to bring the rate to $36 per ton. Okay, we have enhancements then. We have Commissioner Nunley and Commissioner Ward. Commissioner Nunley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, John, thanks, thanks for this. I, quick question, um, with regards to, to this contract, um, presumably, is this, is this an increase that, um, that's, that's negotiable? I mean, I guess I, what are, what are our options here? Or is this pretty much just what, uh, the deck that's handed to us? I mean, are, 
and, and uh, you say it's five cents per ton. And do we know how that's going to affect uh, per household and also how it affects, um, say, bigger developments like apartment complexes, things of that nature, what, what their expenditures are going to be. And I'm just saying this with a mind towards in, you know, in this environment, like what, what are, what are these big costs that some of our um, members of our community can expect in terms um, of price? Just to let you know, last year, we had a couple of dollar per ton increase from them um, from the previous CPI. So this five cents is very, is, is one of the lowest increases we've had. Um, it, it, um, it, well, it obviously is, it's, it's not going to have a, it will have an impact on residential, but not as, not, um, will absorb that cost. It's more of a, it's more going to have an uh, effect on our cost. Um, it does. We did include this in our price increases. Um, if that answers your question. It's, it's built into the $10 per month yes. household fee that we're um, proposing or recommending as part of the operating budget for the new year. And it's, the it's a minimal part of it, but it is yes. built into it. And so I guess it drives to the bigger part of my question. So I did get a clear picture about how that was going to impact our individual households and how that compares with other counties. But, but I guess for, um, for some of the apartment complexes and some of those larger customers of of you know disposable waste, um, what what are the, what are the market impacts going to be for these folks? Because presumably they're, they're renting to people, and um, are, are we going to? I guess it, this this refers to the budget, but maybe we don't have control over it. But but uh, what's going to be the impact to those those groups? So the folks that are going to be renting. Well, we don't have control. I mean, we do, but we don't. This is the only landfill. Um, sure. there, there is another private landfill that, that we could get pricing from, but it, they never can compete with this price. Um, so we, we are kind of, um, they're the closest landfill to us and obvious and the cheapest, we have one of their, the cheapest rates going to that landfill. Sure. Um, and I, and I can tell you that $36 a ton, what we're paying for disposal and transportation um, is fairly is is a good rate compared to you go other places in the state of North Carolina, even landfills um, are going to pay are charging higher rate than that. So, so Commissioner Nunley, maybe to answer your question in another way, to go from six dollars and seventeen cents per month to ten dollars per month for the household fee as you equate on a monthly basis is an increase of three dollars and eighty three cents. Yes, that will have to be transferred to. Um, if, a, if you live in an apartment complex, the owner of that complex is going to have to pass that, has the option of passing that, that charge on. Most likely that individual or corporation will do that. Um, the residential property owner um, will be on their tax bill and will be the, the additional charge. Um, the $3.83 is probably something that we should have increased gradually a dollar a year for the past four or five years. Um, we did not, we, we increased last year and this is a major increase for, for this year. This getting it up to our, our more comparable counties of, as we illustrated during the budget workshops should hold us for a good while where we don't have to consider um, increasing that from $10 a month. Okay, thank, thank you both for cl clarification. That, that just clears it up for me, thank you. And okay, thank you. Commissioner Ward's hand up. Commissioner Ward. Um, that's okay. Thank you. It was a while back. <laughs> okay. Anybody else, Mr. Manager? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, could we get a motion to approve? Um, there's no hands up for a motion yet. Got a um, hand up from Commissioner Albright and Commissioner Ward. Commissioner Albright and Commissioner Ward. For approval, please. Okay. Motion to approve, you said, Ms. Albright? Yes, move to approve. Okay, Commissioner Ward. Second the motion. Has been moved and properly second, Madam Clerk. Yes, Chairman McLaughlin. Yes. Vice Chair Colson. No. Ms. 
Commissioner Albright? Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick? No. Boyd Huggins? Yes. Commissioner Nunnally? Yes. Commissioner Ward? Yes. Commissioner White? No. Commissioner Perkins Williams? Yes. Passes six to three. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Rose. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'm pleased to announce tonight that phase one of the Candlewick's uh, sanitary sewer project is completed. Um, with this, uh, all the sewer project assets are to be transferred to Greenville Utility per the project's interlocal agreement. Um, just as a reminder, we uh, have been at this um, project for quite a while. Uh, this includes about two and a half miles of force main that leads from the city of Greenville at West Point under the new Southwest bypass and on to the Candlewick uh, subdivision and also uh, an area just north of that that's also included in the sanitary district. Uh, all these assets, the force main, the pump station that was also uh, developed just adjacent to the subdivision and all the collection system is to be transferred. The county attorney has been working diligently today. She's edited uh, the bill of sales. She may want to mention a couple of the items that have been included per uh, Greenville Utilities request. And so with that tonight, Mr. Chair, we're recommending the approval and execution of the bill of sale. And this is per the interlocal agreement. And that was included in your package tonight. And that's one that's been amended a couple of times and that's between Greenville Utilities, the county and uh, Candlewick area sewer district. And then also authorizing the transfer of all these assets to Greenville Utilities and that's the easements, a couple of properties that were acquired as well as any other assets that come along with that. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Rowe. A pleasure to board. Do we have any hands, Mr. Matthew? Um, no, you have Commissioner Moore's hand up. Commissioner Moore. Um, I would like to make a motion that we concur with the staff's recommendation to approve the transfer of the CASD sanitary sewer service project to GUC. This is one of the first projects that I attended as a county commissioner and I'm glad to see it come, this part of it, come to this place. Very good. Thank you. Do we have a second to that motion? Mr. Floyd Huggins. A second. Second. Okay, that's been moved and properly second. Madam Clerk. Chairman McLawhorn. Yes. Vice Chair Colson. Yes. Commissioner Albright? Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick? <clears throat> yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick? Yes. Okay. Commissioner Floyd Huggins? Yes. Commissioner Nunnally? Yes. Commissioner Ward? Yes. Commissioner White? Yes. Perkins Williams. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Good, good thank you. Uh, Brian Barnett. Uh, in accordance with North Carolina General Statute 105 in the Machinery Act, the county has to appoint a tax collector and tax assessor. Uh, Sam Kroom has been with the county uh, since September 4th, 2018. Um, initially, uh, the board um, put them for a two-year appointment that would be renewed uh, along with our fiscal year um, in July of 2020. Uh, since this is the last meeting in June, we're bringing it for you today. Um, 
As the board is aware, Mr. Mr. Kroom has direct supervision of both the assessment and collection divisions of the tax office and has performed exemplary manner during his term. Uh, Mr. Kroom also meets all state requirements uh, for the reportment. He holds mapping, assessment, collections, certification, uh, and he is currently continuing his education. He's uh, pursuing an MPA at uh, UNC. Um, by statute, you have the ability to appoint him for renewal uh, for a two-year or a four-year term. Um, it's not written in your description here, but also um, you would ask Mr. Kroom to move to Pitt County and he has met that requirement as well. Uh, it's my recommendation, um, uh, my pleasure to recommend that uh, Mr. Kroom be appointed uh, as tax uh, uh, administrator. Mr. Chairman, I concur with um, Mr. Barnett's recommendation. You have two hands up, Commissioner Perkins Williams, Commissioner Ward. Okay, uh, just for clarification, uh, Brian, was that a two year or four year? Uh, you have the option of two or four. My recommendation would be four. Four, okay, very good. All right, Ms. Ward? Yes, Mr. Chairman, you have hands up for Commissioner Perkins Williams and Ward. Commissioner Perkins Williams. Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept uh, Mr. Barnett and uh, Mr. Scott Elliott's endorsement of appointing uh, Mr. Crooms. Okay, Ms. Ward? For four years. Four years. I would like to second that motion if it's for a four-year term. It is. It is so stated. Okay. Okay, now, she didn't say it, but that was in the motion. That was why I was asking. Yeah, she uh, she stated it. Commissioner Williams stated that. Okay, we're ready to vote. Madam Clerk. Mr. Chairman. Madam Clerk. Yes, sir. Chairman McLawhorn? Yes. Vice Chair Colson? Yes. Commissioner Albright? Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick? Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins? Yes. Commissioner Nunnally? Yes. Commissioner Ward? Yes. White? Yes. Commissioner Perkins Williams? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Very good. Okay. Ms. Manager? We have a series of reappointments and appointments. The first one is um, reappointment to the DSS board. You have Commissioner Mayor Perkins Williams, Williams being recommended by our DSS director. Very good. Pleasure to board. Do we have any hands? Um, Commissioner Ward's hand is up. Commissioner Ward? I move that we, I move that we, uh, reappoint uh, Mary Williams to the Social Service Board. Okay. We have a second. Mr. Nunley's hand is up. Mr. Nunley. I'll second that motion. It's been moving properly. Second, Madam Clerk. Yes, sir. Chairman McLawhorn. Yes. Vice Chair Colson. Yes. Commissioner Albright. Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Yes. Commissioner Nunnally. Yes. Commissioner Ward. Yes. White. Yes. Commissioner Perkins Williams. Yes. Motion passes. Very good. Uh, Scott, Board of Trustees for Pitt Community College. Yes, next, you have a recommendation for um, Mayor Glorstein Brown to be reappointed to the PCC Board of Trustees. Okay, do we have any hands? Um, yes, Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Commissioner Ward. And Commissioner Ward. Move to approve. Okay. Can it? That's been moving properly. I check. That's been moving properly. Second. Madam Clerk. Chairman McLawhorn? Yes. Vice Chair Colson? Yes. Commissioner Albright? Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick? Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins? Yes. Commissioner Nunnally? Yes. Commissioner Ward? 
Yes. Commissioner White. Yes. Commissioner Perkins Williams. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Very good. Thank you. Scott, good point. Okay, next will be item number 10, which is reappointments to the Board of Health recommendation to appoint reappoint Dr. Adam Harrell, who serves as the dentist on the board. Okay. Very good. Do we have any hands? Um, not yet. Um, Commissioner Floyd Huggins. And Commissioner Huggins. Move to approve. Okay, very good. Can we have a second? Commissioner Ward. Commissioner Ward. I second it. It's been moving properly. Second, Madam Clerk. Chairman McLaughlin. Yes. Vice Chair Colson. Yes. Commissioner Albright. Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Yes. Floyd Huggins. Yes. Commissioner Nunnally. Yes. Commissioner Ward. Yes. White. Yes. Commissioner Perkins Williams. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Good. Scott, you up again. Next item number 11, appointment to the Industrial Development Commission Board. On this one, there's not a clear indication of a recommendation, but the you see the abstract Linda Smith name has been vetted. You have three hands up, Commissioner Ward, Perkins Williams, and Nunley. Commissioner Ward. Yes, I'd like to uh, nominate uh, Linda Smith, recommend her. Okay, we have a second. Commissioner Perkins Williams and then Commissioner Nunley. Commissioner Perkins Williams. Smith will be a great choice. Commissioner William. She is a retired teacher. She is very active in the um, Bell Bar community and Crime Watch. And she's been a resident of Pitt County for many years. And she volunteers on various uh, community act activities. I think Mrs. Smith would be a great person for this commission. Okay. So do you second that? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Chairman. Do we have another hand moving properly second. Is there another? Commissioner Nunley's hand is up. Commissioner Nunley. Yeah, the two two things I um and Scott, maybe you can shed some light on this or someone that's in the room on it. Um uh, Scott, your comments, you pointed out that the letter is inaccurate. Um, that, um, and I wonder if you could clarify that too. And then if it is in fact inaccurate, I wonder what, what's the situation about the lack of professionalism? Uh, what, what's, what's, what's the story? All I can comment on that the letter was written before the board acted. Um, I really can't comment on the professionalism part of it. That would really- so, so but but if I understand, so the board did not act to recommend Miss um, Miss Smith. They um, took two votes. I don't think the issue was was the candidate before the, the board. I think it was more the process that was being more more the debate um, in terms of whether they were to, would follow a, a nominating committee process that they had established by motion. Um, I don't think anybody had anything against the candidate. Okay, so so I, I get I, that that clarifies it for me because when I was when I when I was a liaison on the commission, it, if I recall that there was a pr process that the that the PCDC board established whereby they would they would formally recommend folks, and it seems to be that the executive director is overstepping that here. Um, but I wonder if if it would be prudent to um, hear from that board or maybe our board liaison on that. Um, to hear about what what the situation is, and if if there is, and I would have a substitute nomination. Mr. Chairman, that would be um, Commiss Commissioner Fitzpatrick, if um, he so chose to comment. Uh, Commissioner Fitzpatrick, uh, I was unable to attend that meeting, um, so I would not be in a position to comment. Okay, very good. Uh, all right, then, then, Mr. Chair, I would have a, I would have a, um, I would nominate if we're moving forward this. I would nominate Siri Steele um, to serve 
she is a representative, she would be a representative in district three. She's a, um, a woman candidate um, and, and she's from Grimes. And currently there's not a representative from district three serving on the PCDC, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I was the sole uh, member at the time where, when, when I was the rep. So I would, I would um, nominate Siri still um, as uh, to, to fill the seat vacated by Miss Patty Mills. Only I don't believe we have an application, or does, or she's not printed in your pool of applicants. She she, she, she is she is printed, Mister um, Elliot. She was in a she was in an information packet, I believe, uh, two two or well, I guess it was maybe a month ago or something. But she is listed as um, as a candidate. Oh, I'm sorry. She's a 142. I'm sorry. Her name was just. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah, and I believe she is. Yeah. So that would be my nomination to fill the, the vacancy if we're going to move forward tonight. Okay. Okay, that's been. Do we do? Do we need a second on that, um, Madam? Attorney? You've had a, a hand up from Commissioner Ward for a little bit, then also hand up from Commissioner Perkins for yours. Okay, Commissioner Ward. Um, question, Mr. Chairman: You do not need a second for the nomination. You would just vote in reverse order. Commissioner Ward. Understand it is my, it is my understanding that the um, the board, not just one person, has approved this person. A majority have, maybe not everybody on the board, did uh, the uh, recommendation of uh, Linda. So um, I um, I'm waiting for a second to the substitute motion. Mr. Chairman, just to, I guess, clarify, there was there were two votes of the Development Commission on this matter, um, 10 members of the 14 that were that are currently in field seats, 10 were in attendance. Each motion um, was tied five to five, and each motion failed. But again, it wasn't directly toward the candidate. I if the county attorney wants to, she was there too, she can fill in maybe a little bit too, but it, it was more about the process. Would you not agree? You absolutely agree. Um, there was very... There was only favorable discussion about the particular candidate. The, um, the discrepancy in the votes and the failure to make a recommendation had to do with the process that was followed by that board um, and, um, and a disagreement as to whether or not there would have been a nominating process or whether or not it was a, a nomination by the executive director and, and what that letter um, sent. So uh, very little to any conversation by the board about the candidate um, and uh, and there was not a majority vote in favor of this candidate. There were two failed votes um, as it related to the process. And Mr. Chairman, you have a hands up from Commissioner Perkins Williams, Colson, Nunley, and Fitzpatrick. Okay, Commissioner Perkins Williams. Well, um, may I hold my comments to last? Okay, okay very good. Commissioner Colson. Well, I've had extensive talks with Kim Bell. I've talked to Janice about it. I've mentioned it to Scott. And from what I understand in the meeting is uh, while they did object to the process, not one person, in fact, everybody expressed that they had nothing against uh, Linda Smith. And so uh, I, I believe the original motion made should carry. Just that's my opinion. Thank you. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I wonder at this point if we ought to postpone the vote um, to seek clarification from the board. Well, uh, uh, according to uh, Scott and, and the attorney, it was discussed and it was vote five. If five was it five to five? Was the vote five on five. twice five against and five four? Neither of them prevailed. It was five out of ten and five out of ten, so neither motion prevailed. Okay, very good. They needed six to prevail. And you had Commissioner Nunley's hand up, and then I think back to Commissioner Perkins Williams. Okay, uh, Commissioner Nunley. Thank you. So if I understand correctly, the board could not officially give us a recommendation because they deadlocked on whether or not they could give us a recommendation. Is that 
would that be an accurate determination? I, I guess what I'm trying to fi figure out is if, if there's a process established by the board, were they given the opportunity to go through with it? Or so I guess it, it was the vote to not go through that process and to just kind of leave it up to us. Uh, if I can answer that question, uh, I did get a, a call uh, from both Kim Bell and uh, Scott Darnell, both recommending Linda Smith uh, to succeed in that position, if that answers your question. Well, and one of the, and Mr. Chair, and, and one, of the, one of the primary considerations we had with forming the, uh, the nominating committee to, to, to this board was to make sure that there was appropriate oversight on the executive director. I uh, did not want to end up in a situation where, um, where there was a kind of a yes, yes board, but, but we had a board that, that really held the director to accountable um, and to do, to do the job that they were tasked to do, um, whoever that, whoever that, whoever that, um, that member was. So, um, so with all due respect to, to Mr. Darnell, I, without the board speaking behind him, I don't, you know, I personally cannot put any stock in his, his word here, because of course he wants folks on the board that are going to support him. Um, what I'm concerned about is that we've got people on the board that are objective, uh, that are professional, and that are well positioned to serve in the best interest of the economic development needs of our region. Um, and so, um, and I would, I, if, if it's not out of order, I would, I would second Mr. Fitzpatrick's motion to delay uh, for clarification, just, just mainly because I'm, again, I'm not speaking against Ms. Smith. I just, I don't want us, I'm not prepared to vote for if I don't have a clear word from, from the board that, um, that's meant to, to give us that recommendation. So um, if, if we can't do that, I'm gonna recommend the person that, I, that that's in my district um, because I don't, we don't have anyone from my district. So, so that's, I guess that's where I sit on it, but I'll second if it's not in order, Mr. Fitzpatrick's motion. Okay, very so good. Usually you have, a, you have two nominations on the floor and then a motion to table and you would vote in reverse order on all of those. Okay, the first motion then would be? Unless there's further discussion. And you have three hands up. Um, yeah. You had Commissioner Ward, Commissioner Perkins Williams, and then you have Commissioner White. Commissioner Ward? <laughs> the so we are now entertaining a motion, a substitute motion. And is that the first one we vote on? Yes, the substitute motion is the first one. That is to appoint this other person, not Kim Bell. Okay, thank you. No, the, the, the motion that you're voting on would not be to appoint the person suggested, nominated by um, Commissioner Nunnally. The, the first thing that you would be voting on would be to table to delay the vote. Then there's two nominations after that. And then, oh, I, and then what? What is the second one? The next after if that, that one voted down. If that's it's voted down, then you go to the nomination of Sherry Still. Then you go to the original nomination of Linda Smith. Correct. So last, we would be voting on the recommended person from the board. So again, they're not recommended, but it's. If the board didn't well i mean whatever the, the one that was nominated okay all right thank you chairman we have commissioner perkins williams if you want to go next and then commissioner white commissioner perkins williams mr chairman this uh commission the industrial development commission has had a vacancy for a long time and each time the it comes up we talk we bounce around it's very hard to get people to submit their names to, to, to serve on the board. And we always, when we find someone and we are positive about, she's a teacher, she's a retired teacher. I think she's one of the sororities. She, she's a very strong and active person. And, and to change, I was gonna call for the question after Beth, but 
now they're changing the whole thing. Okay, very good. Uh, we'll have Commissioner White, then we're ready to vote. Commissioner White. I was just gonna call the question. Okay, very good. We're ready to vote. Um, Madam Clerk, will you read the motion as to how we're gonna vote first and, and then we'll proceed. Motion is to table the item. The motion is to table the item. Okay, this is the motion. The the table. Okay. Okay, Chairman McLawhorn. No. Vice Chair Colson. Yes. Commissioner Albright. Yes. Patrick. Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Yes, um, just because of process. Commissioner Nunnally? Yes. Commissioner Ward? No. Commissioner White? No. Commissioner Perkins Williams? No. Passes five to four. That's very good. Thank you. All right, do we move on? Chairman, your next appointment is to the Greenville Board of Adjustment. That one you've got um, Mr. Stephen Adkinson is being um, recommended to be reappointed and they will need an alternate seat um, to be brought back at a later time with a, another name. Okay. Do we have any hands? Um, not yet. Uh, Commissioner Nunley? Commissioner Nunley. Commissioner Nunley? Motion to accept. Okay. Do we have a second? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Floyd Huggins? Commissioner Huggins. Second. Let's be moving properly. Second. Madam Clerk? Madam Clerk. Sir, Chairman McLawhorn? Yes. Vice Chair Colson? Yes. Commissioner Albright? Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick? Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins? Yes. Commissioner Nunnally? Yes. Commissioner Ward? Yes. Commissioner White? Yes. Commissioner Perkins Williams. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay. Appointment to the Greenville Plan and Zone. Scott. I um, actually have one before that appointment to the Animal Service Advisory Board. This is for a vacant seat. Recommended to appoint Charlotte Ann Alexander. Okay. Vacant seat. Commissioner Colson has his hand up. Ms. Colson. Motion to approve Charlotte. Motion to approve Charlotte. Okay. We have a second, Ms. Ben. Floyd, Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Commissioner Huggins. Second. Very good. Madam Clerk. Chairman McLawhorn. Yes. Vice Chair Colson. Yes. Commissioner Albright. Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Yes. Commissioner Nunnally. Yes. Commissioner Ward. Yes. White. Yes. Commissioner Perkins Williams. No. Motion passes eight to one. Thank you. Mr. Manager. Last set of, actually it's a reappointment and appointment to the Greenville Planning and Zoning Commission. You have, um, Mr. Jim Collins' term has expired. He's eligible for reappointment. They're being recommended to appoint him. These are basically ETJ appointments for extraterritorial jurisdiction. 
and the vacant seat, um, there are no individuals who reside within the ETJ. They'll advertise and bring us back later times. So at this point, basically, you just have the um, reappointment of, of Mr. John Collins. Okay. We have any? Mr. White. Mr. White. I'm sorry, um, my hand was up from last time to second that motion, but I will make a motion to um, for this. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a second, Mr. Mann? Um, not yet. Commissioner Ward. Commissioner Ward. I'll second the motion. That has been moving properly. Second, Madam Clerk. Chairman McLawhorn? Yes. Vice Chair Colson? Yes. Commissioner Albright? Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick? Yes. Commissioner Floyd Huggins? Yes. Commissioner Nunnally? Yes. Commissioner Ward? Yes. Commissioner White? Yes. Perkins Williams? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Anything else? Let's Certainly. Agenda other than your commissioner's comments and reports. Okay. Uh, as we move forward, let me thank all of the commissioners uh, for your noble act in acting upon the removal, immediate removal of the stature that is at the courthouse. It took courage and it, it took commitment. I want to thank you for that. As having said that, we'll move forward uh, to the other commission, Madam Clerk. Vice Chair Colson. No, no comments. Commissioner Albright. No comment. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. No comment. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. No comments. Commissioner Nunnally. No comments. Commissioner Ward. No comment. Commissioner no comment. Um, Mr. Chairman, I move that we adjourn. Okay, that's been moved. Do we have a second for that? White, any comments? No comment. Okay. Do we have a second, we get a second for adjournment? I think we have a second, uh, Ms. Ward. Okay, Ms. Yes. Ward. Thank you. Ms. Ward, uh, Mr. Manager, you want to remind the uh, board again about the meeting coming for on, uh, on tomorrow? June the 16th is your public hearing on the operating budget for 2020-21. And then we will have then a... <laughs> vote on the budget Thursday morning, the 18th at 9 a.m. would be the scheduled vote. Okay, very good. Go back That's here been, tomorrow night, 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Has been moving properly. Second that we, we adjourn. We now stand adjourned. Oh, Madam Clerk. Yes, sir. Um, Chairman McLaughlin? Yes. Vice Chair Colson? Yes. Commissioner Albright? Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick? No. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Commissioner Nunnally. I'm with Mike. Lock in. No. <laughs> Who did you call? An award. Yes. Commissioner White? Yes. Commissioner Perkins Williams? Yes, Lord. We're now saying the Thank you.